It is six o'clock. So I'm going to call the Town of Deerfield um, Select Board, Board of Health meeting to order. And Trevor, would you mind reading all the sure. access numbers, please? Yep, absolutely. Uh, so it's January 13th, uh, 2021. It's 6 p.m. Um, we're holding our meetings normally in the meeting room, main meeting room in the municipal offices in 8 Conway Street, South Deerfield, Mass. Uh, meetings normally held at the municipal offices are being held remotely with adequate alternative means of public access and where required public participation provided in accordance with the governor's March 12th, 2020 order, suspending certain uh, provisions of the open meeting law, Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 20. Meetings are typically broadcast on Frontier Community Access Television, Remote meeting connections are below on the uh, on the agenda, which you can always find on our town website over on the right hand side in the calendar section. So the dial in number is 312-626-6799. Um, and uh, the meeting ID is 911-604-1580. And the passcode, should you need it, is 570012. And uh, if you if you are online and can go to our Web page and pull up um, the agenda. You'll see all of these, all that information there, along with a link to the Zoom meeting, which you are all in right now. So, uh, meeting attendees should mute their phones, which would be a star six if you're using landlines, uh, unless you're asking a question or commenting. All attendees should wait until um, to speak until other participants are finished. So, welcome to the meeting. Yes, thank you. Now, um, I would love to have the school committee would like to reconvene or convene their meeting tonight. Okay. I'd like to open up our meeting Frontier Regional at 601. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, the first item on our agenda is with the school dis uh, committee is um, the Board of Health is um, going to vote to move forward with the school committee's recommendation. Um, I'm making that motion and I would look for a second so we can have a little bit of a discussion. Yeah, I'll second the motion. Okay, um, just to give a little background right now, um, uh, after speaking with Carl, um, the games are now pushed off until um, January 26th. Um, so uh, it's my thinking that we would actually push off voting for the games then until technically maybe the tw 22nd if our numbers go up or down and we decide to have an emergency meeting. I, kn I know that would be some disappointment, but um, it's, it's really hard for me it, it, to make decisions so far in advance when we have such changeable conditions. Right now, our numbers look not so great because we have a couple work uh, place outbreaks that have affected households. It gives us some rather high numbers, but I do feel like um, having chased down all cases in the town myself, personally, I know um, the exposure to the schools and I feel like um, the schools are right now safe. Uh, the kids as a precaution, um, did not have practice on Monday and Tuesday, and they are now for the rest of the week just uh, either doing having a virtual choice or um, out in the parking lot. No one is even inside. So uh, deciding on the games, I would like to just push off, but I'm, I'm, I am feeling comfortable with having basketball inside. If we go forward with the games on the 22nd, if we choose to um, not go forward, then we'll have a meeting. So what we're saying is that we're pushing off the decision and then we'll have a meeting if we feel necessary. Otherwise it is, a, it is a go going forward, but no spectators in the gym. I'm, if our numbers continue to get really better, then I'm willing to review just, just like always, review um, seniors having maybe one parent or two, but I'm, I'm not comfortable right now with any parents, any spectators in the, in the gym um, if we do go forward with games, but I'm not saying that we're going forward with games at this point either. 
Karen, I just want to do one point of correction of just because people are listening and <clears throat> the girls have been practicing since Monday. We held up on the boys due to um, due to researching a COVID issue. So the girls have been in the gym since. Oh, OK. I'm sorry. I was just, I just don't want anybody out there saying about the boys. I, was I don't want a false information being, you know, not saying you're saying false. You know what I'm saying? I just want to be yes. sure. Yes. Knows I'm sorry. I was concerned about the boys. So, yes. Um, so now that everyone's confused because I've been rambling, uh, let's let, let's well, go. Let's answer questions. Yeah. Do you want to hear um, from the school committee at all? And yes. Yeah. Melissa. Yeah. I guess I guess I have uh, a couple of things to to think about. Is this kind of can keeps getting kick down the road closer and closer to this decision about uh, games. I'm not sure uh, if somebody could kind of weigh in on the risk versus benefit with games. If we're not necessarily talking about keeping these kids inactive, allowing them to play, but not travel to other communities and have larger groups in the gym. What's the risk versus benefit that makes that benefit of having intermixed communities with larger groups together worth the risk of transmission. Uh, if we look at a, a couple of things, uh, kind of raise my concern about this. One is that if you look at a large lab in Western Mass, we are seeing rates among kids under 18 going up fairly significantly in the last month. Um, uh, this is like doubling in the last month in terms of incidence rates. And if we look at a site like um, healthychildren.org put out by the AAP, and we look at what risks we should look at when we look at whether or not uh, this is a high risk or low risk activity, basketball's indoors, in close contact. If we're looking at games, they're going to be together for longer than 15 minutes in groups that are larger than 10, even though they may not be on the court. This is either inside in groups larger than 10 or on the bench in groups larger than 10, they're sharing equipment by virtue of the ball and traveling to other communities, all of which tick the higher risk group uh, with the AAP uh, guidance on what to do with youth sports. And the only real mitigating factor we're doing is face coverings. And I'm, I'm just, curious kind of where the risk versus benefit ratio comes into play to, to um, make that decision. I, I'm going to have Carl address that because we talked about, um, you know, wiping down the balls and all the protocols are happening. So I would like Carl to address that to the group so people are informed. So in terms of protocols for safety, um, it's the balls would be sanit like it's not just masks in, in that sense. There, um, there's countless sanitizer, uh, sanitizer on the way in, sanitizer on the way out. Locker rooms are closed. Um, in practices, they they are when they're not doing any sort of a scrimmage, they're they're separated into smaller groups. Um, there's, um, geez, there. I I think if I had bought sanitize stock in a sanitizer company I would be rich at this point we have so much sanitizer going around and being sprayed the backpack sanitizer um, so of course not all the risk is wiped out by that but um, we are more than following what the MIA and EEA guidelines are in terms of sanitizing and spacing and all that kind of stuff for example um, when we have a team in the gym right now um, the that we put around the gym for practice are, are 12 feet apart instead of six um, just to, you know, amplify that to get even more space apart. Um, so that's in terms of sanitizer. Does that answer that question for you? I guess the root of my question is what's the risk versus benefit in terms of having these kids play in games with yeah. intermixed community? So is, is there that much of a benefit in having them engage in that, that it's worth the risk that it poses both to the kids and to the communities, including their families? Sure, so I, I guess I would say that's a question of uh, what people believe or how people feel personally. 
and what the Board of Health says. Um, I, 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 you know what I mean? Like that's a more of a, I, I guess, a personal opinion because to some kids, they just want to be active and other kids, you know, for the, like the senior specifically, maybe they, they're thinking, man, this is our last chance to play basketball against these other towns we've played against. So it, it's hard for me to, to give a blanket statement on that with it being what I feel a, a I don't want to say opinion on the, on the, you know what I mean? Like it does. Yeah. So. I think it does different, different depending, you know, if you're, if you're a ninth grade versus you're a senior, you're trying to, you know, go to college and, yep. um, you know, you're trying to hone your skills and, and be noticed and, and that kind of thing. So the, you know, the benefit of being able to play certainly would, you know, be different for o- older kids than younger, but there's definitely a risk. I mean, there's no doubt basketball is probably the one, you know, the one sport that, gives me a little bit of concern and that's why I kind of felt you know if we it's hard too because you know seniors you want your parents to to see you play parents want to see the kids play their last year and that kind of thing so but but it is one of those things that if 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 we can allow kids to play and 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 hopefully have a game um you know any way that we can reduce that risk by you know having less people in the gym watching and that way if we could get fcat to film and have it live streamed I know it's not the same but whatever we can do to get through this this year would be great. But you're right, it's, it's, it's a tough decision. Sure. I mean, I, I think like when I look at this in the context of businesses opening up and people's livelihoods or kids that are more engaged in, in learning and, and those kind of things, I see kind of a, a clear understanding of what the risk versus benefit ratio. I'm not sure that I understand that there is such a significant benefit ratio to playing in a game with another community versus being able to play even in an intramural fashion. Well, I think Melissa, we do feel that um, there is some, there is some concern because you're mixing the kids from different towns. And so what, that's why I'm hesitant to vote to move forward with the games until we get closer to the schedule of the games. Um, to see what the numbers are in the other communities. I mean, right now, if you just look at numbers, Deerfield or the F- South County has higher numbers and they probably will have higher numbers as the college kids drift into town than um, you know, the other communities in, in the county. As Darius had pointed out um, last meeting, it, you know, we, we only play the schools in the county. So, um, you know, we're the probably the not attractive community communities to be playing. So the concern would probably would be with us. But um, and I want to just see what our our caseloads look like next week. Um, right now, I I feel the kids are safe in school, um, based where our numbers are coming from and where where they are from. But you know we need to have another opportunity to look at this before we move forward, I think, because there is a higher risk. But I don't, I don't, I, the kids are in school for the most part. So I, I feel like having um, practice and playing together is, is okay. Um, the hockey team has been very cooperative and understands that um, the high risk is really in the locker rooms and, you know, bathrooms and stuff. So I think you know, they've been very cooperative. They've been forthcoming and um, issues. So I, I feel like the kids understand that if they want to play, they've got to pay attention. They've, they've got to be proactive in trying to keep the risk as low as possible. And I think they're motivated. I think us as a community are motivated to keep our kids in school and to allow our kids to play sports. Um, the numbers, community numbers are really looking good compared to what they were after Thanksgiving. I, I feel bad there are, our numbers are high, but it is directly related to a couple workplace issues. And um, I mean, it's out there, but I think if people continue to be safe and the kids are motivated to be safe and pay attention, then, then they should be rewarded to be allowed to play, I think. I think it's important that kids play. Carol, I if, they can, if they can safely. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously want everyone to be safe. 
Um, I'm piggybacking on Missy. Miss, uh, hey, Carl, do you know what the protocol is going to be at, at the other schools with fans? We know what we're trying to do with either no fans or maybe one parent. Do we know what's going to happen in the other communities that we're going to be playing? Yeah, um, as of right now in Franklin County, they, they don't, they're not having any fans home or away. Okay. Oh, so, good. Yeah, oh, great. That was, a great, that was a good question, Bob. I, I hadn't even thought of that, actually. I was more concerned about what was happening in our gym. Um, and, and if I get one more thing, just in terms that I didn't mention before, in terms of like um, the benefits of games versus practices is, is the normal, the normalcy and like social emotional benefits, obviously, you know, that it's tough to measure that, but it's, it's important to these kids. Um, and then not having visiting fans is a huge thing because like we can't track, it's so much harder to track. Like we know who the parents are of, the, of our seniors. So if we were to have fans, you know, we're going to know who they are and they're already in the community. So, um, and the last thing I would say is the, the kids, like the kids that I talk to in class now that, that are signed up for sports, they, they're telling me how that they're trying to be extra careful because they want this to happen. Um, so they understand, and somebody else started to mention this, but you know, they, they understand the, that I'd like to think that this is going to help them be more compliant with rules at all times so that, that the season doesn't get taken away from them because of some sort of spike that they, they're involved with, you know? So that was to finish the question, the answer to, to Missy's question. Are there any other? Carl, if I could jump in on, on what you were saying there. Um, I think there's, when you're dealing with athletics and being a big basketball guy in my younger years, is that there's a lot of difference between playing yourself and playing somebody else. It changes the whole how practice orientates because you're orientating to play another team. You have plays, you have offenses, you have whatever. It's not pickup. Um, and I think, you know, there is a difference between the two. But I really think we're, we're starting to come down where values are within the community and with individuals. I mean, I go by restaurants and I say to myself, why are people taking the risk to go out? I went past Friendly's in Greenville the other day, it was packed. I'm like, people are going to Friendly's right now? I mean, I love Friendly's, you know, you know, I love a good, you know, a good waffle fry. Um, but really right now, that's what the, the choice is. But people, are, you know, people are making a choice. And I know we're kind of starting in that middle as a governing body of like, how do we put the values of where we think things are and apply them to athletics? You know what I mean? But I, there is a big difference between doing pickup and doing and preparing for a match, and even you only have a few of them. You know, I think it, it gives there's a, a focus that comes into the practice there that's important. So um, I'm not leading, you know, saying one thing or another absolute, but I think there's a big difference in what you're providing and what the kids perceive you're providing. Thank you. Yeah, I, I I know it sounds awful to like I say to put off again. You know, but I, I, I feel strongly the kids need to have be motivated to go forward and, and, and be careful and, and try hard. Um, and I want to give them every opportunity. So, I know uh, Damien and, and Phil, Phil Cantor have questions still. And I know there is a question uh, from Betsy Sobieski too, but I was just having um, the school committee members speak first and then reach out. Okay, go ahead. Thank you for seeing that, Trevor. Sure. Uh, Damien, do you want to? Shoot first and then Phil. Yep. Okay. Okay. I was trying to find the unmute button. You got me. <laughs> yep, we got you. Uh, yeah, I guess I'll just uh, kind of bounce off of what both uh, Darius and and Carl were saying, and, and along with what Missy's originally original question is, I think there is a difference between just practice and competition. And coming from literally this fall my daughter who plays soccer missed out on competition this fall. And there was a big difference. She was not as interested in the game of soccer as she had been since kindergarten. And it was really, really hard to watch. Um, I hope she continues to play soccer and I hope this all changes next year, but seeing a difference with just intramural practice versus going to the games, and having camaraderie with your teammates, it's a, it's a big difference. Now, I'm not saying what the risk outweighs the benefit at all, but there is a dramatic difference between competition and just going and practicing for an hour. Thank you. Bill? Yeah, um, 
I, so the, the first thing I want to say is that um, we as a school committee already voted back in December or whatever mm -hmm. to proceed with winter sports. So, yes. I mean, right. So we understand that the Board of Health can say, you know, no. Um, but just, I mean, the way that we're phrasing the whole issue, it's as if it's sort of an, in a vacuum or whatever. But technically, it would be the Board of Health overruling the, 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 the school committee were they to cancel um, any individual sport. I mean, I, I could yep. be wrong about that, but um, the, uh, and then the, the other thing is that, and related to this, I guess, is that um, the whole issue of hockey, whatever, because I thought that, that it was determined that the hockey is up, sort of governed by the Greenfield Board of Health. Right. So, so I mean. But the, you can still, the school committee can still not allow the hockey team to play. And okay. so, but okay. I, I'm, I myself am saying, I feel like the hockey team is aware of um, the risks and, and they are staying out of the locker rooms that they've had, they know the protocols, they know to talk to us and, um, and give us information and, and abide by the rules. So, I mean, I'm, I'm okay with the hockey, just to put it out there. Um, just because I have had multiple conversations and, and, you know, we've already had stuff happen and the protocol, they, they abided by all the protocol. And so, I mean, I'm comfortable that the hockey team understands and that they're motivated. The kids are motivated and the families are motivated to keep the risk as, as low as possible. Um, and, but I feel the same way with, um, basketball. I mean, Carl, you know, had to talk to the kids and say that no one was getting cut. And don't worry, if you don't feel good, don't come. You're not going to be penalized for not showing up. And, you know, we're, we're really trying to get the kids involved and, and be responsible for their actions. If you want to hang out with your friends, then you will not be having practices. You can't do that. This is, this is you know, you got to be motivated to be responsible. And I, I feel like the kids are, and we've put it out there multiple times in the community. We want our schools open and we want our kids playing sports. And so the community needs to pay attention. And, and I feel like they have been, our numbers are, are reflect that. I mean, the case profile reflects that, not the numbers, the case flow, uh, profile really does reflect that people are taking responsibility and paying attention mm -hmm. and that do want school open and that do want sports to be played. So, I mean, I, I'm for it as long as it's safe. And, and, but, I, but I've had multiple conversations with Carl and, and, and the bottom line is if I feel at all, there's any chance or Carl, Carl hears anything or Darius hears anything, Meg hears anything, then we're shutting everything down for a while or we're going out to the parking lot again or whatever. If there's any whiff of anything, no one he is hesitating here. It's just, we need to take, we need to keep paying attention and we have to really analyze what's happening every single day. And I, there's a huge amount of t work involved in that, but I, I really feel it's worth it because it's keeping our community safe and it's keeping our schools open and, and, and safe and, and letting kids play sports. So I, I, I don't wanna come down and, and say no because I think there is a real motivation here to make it, make it be, make it happen. Um, got a, I got another question, Trevor. Yep, go ahead, Bob. And I know Melissa so, too, and then I'd, I'd like to get to Betsy too at one point too. Yep. Go ahead. I, I just wanna know, when do we think we're gonna to have to re, re, come back and revisit this? Do we have a, a particular day yet that we wanna revisit this? Well, this is what I was thinking, Bob. I know this is really difficult, but I was hoping I made the motion to move forward uh, with the recommendation of the, the school committee's recommendation to move forward. We would vote to support that, or we would vote to that we endorse that. I just want to have a caveat that if our numbers or we got stuff happening next Friday, the 22nd, I wanted to have the Board of Health have a meeting. That's Dave, Trevor, and I have a meeting to say we're not comfortable with going forward on the games. Right now, we're saying move forward as if we're going to participate in the games. But I do want to reserve 
some kind of five o'clock or six o'clock meeting, whatever Dave can make um, based on his schedule, just I'm not comfortable having the games and we're gonna have a meeting. We're gonna have an emergency meeting and the games are off on you know the following Tuesday um, until mm -hmm. we have better numbers or the situation is better, whatever. That's all. Yep, sounds good. And Melissa, you uh, one more question then I wanted to get. All right, it's so weird. I should change it. Uh, I, my, my mom is the oh, only one who calls right. me Melissa. But <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, down the screen. <laughs> sorry, Missy. <laughs> no, it's all good. Um, I I guess I I just have kind of a, a public health request. If sure. if we can just kind of be mindful, both in the school committee and. Uh, a request for the Board of Health to be mindful of using the term safe, that when we're talking about getting 50 people in a, uh, in a gym together and wearing masks, that all of a sudden this activity is now safe. Uh, that I think really what okay. we need to Okay, I saying, should say lower risk, lower risk. You're right. That, yeah, because yeah. I, I think that right. it's, I mean, there's all sorts of ways that people perceive these things. So if we are going forward and we're gonna mix communities and we're gonna have 50 people together wearing masks and we're gonna say, you know what, we have no spectators, so now it's safe. Right. I, that is a misleading statement yep. that then becomes arguments for other people to, to do the types of things that Darius was talking about. Right. You know, like now Friendlies is packed and you right. know, the, these are the kind of Good things point. and everybody's gonna make their own decisions, but as a, Board of Health and as a school committee, it's important for us to kind of be putting forth things that really help people to make the right decisions so that we can continue to do these things. Yeah, that's a good point. Missy, you're absolutely right. And I apologize. It should be less risk. Yeah. Um, Betsy, uh, Sylvia SK, I know you, you wanted to make a comment. Welcome. Yeah, um, thank you. I've been sure. having a little difficulty with my phone. Can you hear me guys? Yes, we can. Yes. Sure. Awesome, yeah. awesome. Okay, thank you. Um, I just have three points of concern that I'm hoping I can get some uh, clarity on. And I know you guys just moved the date again, but I'm still going to ask just because yep. I know it's probably, um, I know it's been spoken about before and, and it's on everybody's minds now. Um, so the community obviously has been trying uh, its best to protect its bubble, um, like the Halloween trick or treating at the end of the driveway not gathering for Thanksgiving, Christmas, no soccer games this year, even though it was outside and modified. Um, I'm sure there's more examples, but uh, anyways, since basketball has been deemed a high risk, high contact sport, what would be the decision if our team was to uh, play a team either home or away that is from a community with a red status, uh, would the risk to our students in playing a team from a community that has these high numbers of infections outweigh the benefits? So that's number one. Um, number two, we put so much effort into the hybrid and remote school models while emphasizing social distancing and safety. Would it be an option uh, at this point? Um, I know, again, we've pushed the date back for both parents and players of these teams to have a survey on how they feel given the present uh, COVID numbers and concerns surrounding playing and traveling to other communities. Um, would practices only be a safer first step for our children versus traveling to other communities. Um, and then, and then uh, number three is, well, actually I don't know if I should do BO3 because you guys have already decided to push the date back. Um, so, you know, I, I completely understand and support the importance for our children to interact with their friends and classmates and teammates. I mean, I'm a basketball coach. I understand uh, the importance of getting on a basketball court. Um, but, you know, we, like everybody is saying, the safety issue, and I'm glad Missy um, brought up a couple good points also. Um, I know for our family, basketball practices have been the first time our daughters have been uh, able to see their, their, some of their classmates and teammates since we went into shutdown mode due to COVID. Um, so I'm just kind of curious on those things. And I really appreciate you guys, all the hard work. I know there's a lot of thought process that goes into us and everybody's comfort level is different. Um, but I appreciate you guys and, uh, and putting all this effort into the students to give them the safest place to start back into normalcy, even though it's not what they're used to. So um, those are kind of my three questions. I was hoping you guys would clarify, hopefully. Thank you. Well, I guess I would start by addressing the red. The red would mean, that means there's a certain number of cases that are happening in that community per 
um, hunt, you know, per a thousand, hundred, whatever they, they'd use the index for. The, what is critical is what's the profile of those cases? Are those cases, can you track those cases and how, what's my, well, it would be my comfort level in, 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 a, in that community's ability to trace their, um, their numbers. And, and what those numbers are saying. Is it from a workplace and it's two or three households from a workplace? So that's how you got your numbers, like it is for our community right now? Or is it wide, so widespread and or, or are you sending it, is it being sent out to, you know, are you tracing your own, your own community? Like are you tracing, college, yeah, are you yeah. tracing your own? Um, uh, what? what? You're tra are you tracing your own cases, you know, that kind of stuff? And um, it, 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 we put in a huge amount of hours in Deerfield, knowing where our cases are coming from and making sure we've tracked down every single case and, and the contacts from those cases. So is it, it, it's hard, it, as Missy said, it's not safe, but it's, what is the risk? It is far lower risk in our community than, than our status uh, or the number of cases that we have. So, you know, I, I would want to look at the game schedule. Um, that's part of, you know, I would follow up with Carl is look at the game schedule, what community is playing when, and are they coming to our community? Or are we going to their community? How are kids being transported? Um, our parents driving the kids to the to the location and then staying in the parking lot and making sure the kids just come back out to the parking lot. I mean, the whole thing. Um, so Betsy, that would be the first thing. I don't know if Trevor, you want to say anything or Dave, um, how we follow cases. Yeah, it, it is a little bit of a struggle because, you know, um, Carolyn is, is certainly in touch with a lot of the other boards of health and, you know, public nurses that are that are doing a lot of the tracing in, in our surrounding communities. Um, so our, you know, South County, pretty good, and you're definitely in touch with Greenfield and, and all, so, um, and Montague, but, um, you know, we know a lot better, the as Carolyn said, the makeup of, of the cases and why, why a town, you know, why our numbers are high, and so we, we can kind of dig into those numbers and go, okay, this is really not school-based related. It's workplace and several homes from a workplace that really threw our numbers up. Um, so we still feel like comfortable. If we just didn't know and we just said, oh, there's a bunch of cases, we don't know where they're from, I'd feel a lot more difficult. But but it is a good point and hard to hard to judge, you know, are those other communities doing that same kind of work that we're doing to, and, and you know, and we're just not bored of health of, of their community, so it's hard to tell. But we are definitely in touch. Carolyn's definitely in touch with with a lot of the people in these areas that we'd be playing. So, uh, but not everywhere. So it's, it's it is hard. It's a, it's a difficult area to have your eyes on every community. Does that yeah. answer your question, uh, Betsy? Okay. Um, Dave, did... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Wolfram. Okay. Uh, well. You know, I'm really torn on the issue because one, my daughters, my older two daughters, um, if they didn't play their senior year, one of them wouldn't be memorialized in the good no gym up next to Betsy's name. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what the impact that would have on the family. But... I think that children's health is more important now and with a new COVID strain, which is going to be hitting Massachusetts. Don't be fooled that it's not. Right. Uh, the chances of transmission is higher and it's hitting the younger population. So we really have to be diligent on this and unfortunately just take one step at a time until we can come up with a good solid number of low risk. I think the kids should just practice and not have games. Hmm. That's my opinion. Yep. Trevor, uh, Livia yeah. wants to ask a question. Oh, please do. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, school committee, yep. I had to figure out how to unmute and everyone in my house is running around, so sorry. <laughs> um, so um, a number Olivia, of things. You're upside down. Uh, I'm you're upside good. down. You're good. Yeah, we can see you. <laughs> her, her camera's on an angle. <laughs> yeah. It's because I have to use 
Uh, yeah, there you go. Okay. Um, so a few things that are kind of scattered now because I've been listening to what people have been saying and they've been saying a lot of good points. And um, I, I need to say that um, with, uh, I completely agree with Mr. Wolfram um, about, and I know I've said this before and I know school committee already voted and um, it's not up to me now, but that um, the playing of games while really, really important and um, you know, I was in school when Betsy was the one put up on the walls, you know what I mean? So I, I get how important, you know, that is and what a difference it can make, especially in your senior year to be the one who's not playing for sure. I have a senior, I mean, she doesn't play basketball or anything, but um, I know how important that is, but it doesn't seem like the risks are outweighing. I mean, that it seems like the risks are outweighing um, the positives um, in that respect. But also one of the things for me um, that I've had to talk to, not so much my kids, but some other younger students about is the perception that is coming from this. You know, when we have said, you know, don't go with your families, you know, you're not, sleepovers of course aren't okay. You know, all of those, you know, don't get together in large groups at all. And now we're saying, unless you're with your coach, you know, 12 of the people you've been playing with, 12 of your friends, and then it's also fine to take that group and go to another school and play with a whole bunch of other people. Um, I'm all for practicing, I'm all for getting the activity out, um, but my concern is the perception that we're giving because we're saying one thing and then we're saying another. Um, it is, and that's, that's definitely coming across to some of our younger kids. Um, and then lastly, so in the past, and this might be completely different because of the way crazy schedules are right now in the schools, but in the past, a lot of times other schools would arrive before school was out, you know, or when it was time for you to go to your, um, basketball game, you know, you'd be dismissed early and you'd go to another school and you would end up at that school before school was released. And so what I want to know, because I know that Board of Health um, is in charge of like, you know, the buildings and, and shutting those things down and, and not so much if winter sports can go forward because we already voted on that. But um, if games happen and my children are in school, are they also going to be exposed, even though I chose, I would choose for them not to play a winter sport, are they going to be exposed and everyone in the school be exposed because other kids are coming in without school being over? Am I making that clear? I feel like I'm rambling and that's not being really clear, but I guess I'm wondering if people are gonna come into the school before school's over making it. Um, that's a good question, and, Olivia. I actually hadn't asked Carl that. So Carl, do you know if um, when the kids are supposed to be scheduled to come? Sure, um, I, I, I haven't been doing this job very long, but I don't know of any time that I could think of as my, an athlete myself going to a school when the school is still in session. Maybe a school gets dismissed early, the athletes. But um, and anyways, for this case, the games right now, JV would be at four o'clock and the varsity would be at 5.30. And the athletic directors have an agreement that we would not get our teams there for the games any more than 15 minutes before the start of that JV game. Um, okay. So the earliest the team would be there would be 3.45. That's, helpful. That's excellent to know. Thank you so much because that makes a difference on whether I'd be willing to send my kids to school knowing sure. that they could be put in a situation with kids from another school, but knowing that they won't, that that's that's very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Carl, I just um, wanted to know how are the kids being transported? I um, that I was assuming that parents would be bringing their own kids, but is that not true? It sounds like that's so not true. it did. I mean, from all the schools, it depends. It's different, I think, for each school. Um, I can tell you that for our girls program, we're going to have only a varsity team with the, with the numbers of kids we have. So we will have a bus option. But you know, if games get approved, we'll also, if parents feel better about bringing their their child to, to the uh, away game, that's obviously acceptable. Um, where in, in years past, you would want the team as like a bonding thing to be together on the bus. Um, so yeah, we'll have a bus and the option of people driving their, their uh, kids. I, I guess I would, I, um, for the 22nd, 
uh, I would want to know um, what parents are driving and what parent and the number of kids on the bus because again you know we really need to look at the low risk kind of thing yep and I can risk. I can I can have the coaches find out you know okay. from the players right. where, where they stand for that right that would be perfect thank you um, and we have a uh, comment uh, Glenn Glenn Dulet wanted to speak I know you had your hand up Glenn Thank you. You're welcome. I think there's a lot of, you know, and you guys can stop me wherever, wherever, but um, there's a lot of safety measures that are put in place going from practices to travel to, um, you know, and protocols put in place to protect the safety of the students, the, the coaches, and and the students. Um, you know, I think, I think Carl hit a lot of the points, you know, and I wanted to just really emphasize a few. You know, within basketball specific, yeah, it's a high risk sport, but the modifications that we put in place, it's not just mask. I mean, in between drills, kids are hand, hand sanitizing uh, themselves to re reduce some of the uh, touching. They're, they're, they're cleaning balls. They're keeping balls to individual players. Um, you know, the storage of the equipment. Uh, I don't know about at Frontier, but my school, it's in individual bags contained uh, six feet socially distance. I believe at Frontier, they're not even bringing it into the building. No sports are using locker rooms. Transportation basically is, you know, um, dictated by, um, you know, what the school district and what the health health feel like is uh, is appropriate. You know, at my school, I stole it from Darius was getting the parental consent that they can travel, you know, they can, they can, they, they don't need to, I don't need to provide transportation and that the parent will, tr you know, I, I, I gave them the permission to travel, you know, there's, there's ways to go around it and actually encourage that, um, you know, during the fall, the tracking that takes place, you know, is, is immense. And that's when we get to a game, we hand the roster so that the, you know, at an away game so that they know who's there. There's, and I, I'm glad Carolyn really dove into some of the metric stuff, metrics and numbers. You have the ability to, to look at what families this is taking place. Is it, is it school directly related? And what interventions that we have, you know, that we can put in place to keep that. And at all points, you can stop practices based off of an outbreak because that's, those are standards that we have to follow. We have no choice, yeah. um, you know, you know, I personally use my nursing. We have a number of cases. We have, you know, the expectation is if you're sick or, or ill, you notify the coach, you notify the nurse. That's a preventative measure and families take it serious. And I think the kids who really value this are really going the extra step outside of the school to make sure that they're not, you know, that they're being smart. And that's one of the things that I said to my athletes is every day that we're on the court or on the ice is a win. This isn't about wins and losses. This is about being able to participate with our, with our friends as a community, as a school. And that is huge for their social emotional well being. And then going out to a, a community to play a rival greenfield in a crowd of none, because that's the safest way to do. The kids don't care about that. The kids care about being able to get down and play with their friends in a safe manner. Yeah, there's, there's mass, there's, you know, we limited rosters, you know, we, we did the safest measures for travel. There's so many different things that people outside of athletics, outside of the realm, and I can't even hit all of them um, that we're doing. And, 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 and I can say for my community, in my, you know, that I'm working with, if my daughter, and my daughter's from Frontier and as a senior and didn't play basketball and, 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 and you know, and, and lost out on softball last year and, and is going away, this is huge for our social emotional well-being. You know, so much has been taken away from them already. This is not a normal year. And, and right now, currently, I would say in basketball practice, you know, a, a roster of 15, I think you're exceeding some of the standards that you're doing in high school right now. We have mass breaks. Yep. They go outside. They take their mass breaks. They're taking frequent breaks. They're hand gelling. Do you hand wash going into a classroom? I'd say they, you know, the amount of gel that you're going to go through in a week, I'm going to invest in gel, you know, and these are like what we said, are we reducing risk? Are, is, are we making it safe? We're minimizing risk. We're minimizing risk. We're, this is, this is, you know, you know, what we're, what we're doing for our kids, for our community. And 
I'm telling you, you know, I think there is, a, if you take that opportunity away, I think, you know, the kids are going to go outside and play pickup or go to the wire, do things, you know, silly. I mean, this is an incentive for them and an incentive for the community. Um, you know, in regards to games, you know, it goes back to the administration to feel what's comfortable around the health. You know, if you don't feel comfortable playing a Greenfield and, and past president in the fall, you had to stop and re because of, of an opposing school notified there was a situation and these were low risk, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Carl and Darius, maybe it was cross country. Nope. We had to stop that event. We're going to reschedule it. We're going to move it down the road because at that time it's going to be safe. The, the communication between schools, you know, it was, it's a must. It's because it's about the safety and that's past president. It's a small community. You got Greenfield, you got no, it's not like down here, as Sean would talk, Sean McDonald would say, we're radioactive down here. Mm -hmm. um, we're we're bigger numbers. You're intimate. You have you have the ability to to really reach in and, and find out that information that's needed. And I, I just think there's so many things that um, you know that you're doing to keep this safe and safer, minimizing risk. Um, it's less risky. Less risky. However you want to put it. And um, you know, the, the coaches and, and, and the administration and, and the support of families, you know, that's the number one goal. So we can get some type of normalcy for these kids, you know, um, in this abnormal world right now. It's crazy. Yeah. Thank so, that so the motion on the table right now, the Trevor second, is to move forward with the school committee's recommendation of, for winter sports. Um, with the caveat that we're going to review around the 22nd, um, the Board of Health may have a meeting to review whether to go forward with games or not. Um, I just, I would like to make us have an opportunity or have it, make it clear that we need an opportunity for review. Um, David, do you feel comfortable with that? You're, you're muted, David. Yeah, I am. I'm available on the 22nd to meet. So, okay. Okay. Um, Bet uh, Betsy had one more comment, I think, and then I think we'll maybe take a vote. Okay. Betsy, go ahead. Okay. I think I'm unmuted now. Um, <laughs> I, I hear, you know, Glenn brought up some great points. Um, it's it's a really hard decision um and we I, i'm actually not coaching this year because you know for the the best interest for our, our my family and i have two mm -hmm. players on the team i have a senior um and you know I, i've told them don't take it for granted that you're able to walk on this floor one more time i mean it's kind of funny everybody's talking about my name on the banner but amelia's missing out on putting her name on the banner this year she had a shot at that and, you know yeah. there's huge disappointments that go with these decisions but yeah. you know as my coach used to say a short-term answer is is a uh, is better for a long-term solution um i it's amazing hearing how all these precautions have been put in place but as David said, there is a new strain coming and not that I wanna put fear in everybody, but you know, we have to be sending yeah. that message that we're gonna put their safety first. So yep. I'm glad that you guys are gonna put off answering. Um, uh, you know, I, I think it's good that these kids are getting in the gym, but I, I really stress, I've played basketball, I coach basketball. It's gonna be really hard to tell these kids not to take, not to make contact. And you know, you're touching, you're sweating, you're breathing it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough to try to make it so they don't, they don't get, uh, you know, they don't get sick. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess that's where I'll leave it now. Cause I know you guys are going to come Thank back you. at it and hopefully I can get my phone yeah. figured out and have yeah. a conversation with you guys again, because it, yeah. it's, and I know everybody's taking it seriously and I appreciate that, but yeah, it's, it's a disappointing thing <laughs> to have to have these conversations, but thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy. Thanks, um, Betsy. And I think we really would, um, even if we move forward on the 22nd, you know, as, as we have with making decisions with, with education and will we be remote or will we be in, in person, we will not hesitate to jump in and make a change um, if we feel the need is there. So I, I just want to say again, I, I feel very comfortable with Carl. Carl has been willing to um, 
answer all my questions. He's been willing, to, you know, he's, he is putting the safety of the kids first. And I, I, I guess that's why I feel comfortable moving forward and working with him because um, he knows that this is very serious and that we're trying everything we can to keep the kids, um, you know, healthy. Um, I guess Lou, you wanted to say say something quick. Yeah, yeah. I would just l love to support Betsy in everything that she said tonight. And as a parent of a ball player, um, I have made the very hard choice to disappoint my child by not allowing them to partake in even the practices because I just believe that um, this is not safe. This is not a safe scenario to have. The protocols in place that we have been so sincerely upholding and then to suddenly switch it up and say it's okay for 25 kids to be in a contact sport interacting and yes they're going to sweat and they're going to breathe on each other it's going to happen hand sanitizer doesn't do anything about airborne particles it, it it's not you know these kids are are 13 and 14 years old or or, or even more scary, the idea of interacting with other schools. I mean, I, I cannot stress enough how much everything that Betsy said touched me and that I think that, you know, unless you have protocols and plans in place for how you're gonna address families once COVID starts to spread because of this town's desire to play ball, um, I don't, I just feel embarrassed. And frankly, I am, what I am seeing tonight appears to be some form of insanity that, that our COVID cases are rising, where a new strain is coming in, our cases are higher than ever, and we're suddenly going to try to do something new inside the building with our youth. I, I'm dumbfounded and can't leave this meeting without leaving you with that thought. And I hope you reconsider the entire sports system this winter and think about doing something outside with these kids so that perhaps they could have some badly needed social interaction, maybe by having frontier sledding or frontier um, street hockey or something where they can be outside where we're not actually faced with this issue of, are we going to take the risk of potentially killing people over basketball? Think about that, please. Thanks for your comment, Lou. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, so all those in favor? Dave Wolf, am I? Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, we're gonna continue on with our select board meeting, um, but the school committee might want to adjourn. Yeah, thank please, you, I thank you everyone to... for your comments. I really Case. appreciate everybody's input. It Case, is very I difficult. I wanted to mention or have Jen, if you're on the line, can you please schedule? Um, a meeting just so we have it on the board so it's not an emergency meeting we're already on it thank you thank you i need a motion from frontier to adjourn move to adjourn mr chair thank second. you phil second thank you phil judy you gonna do a roll call sure bob yes phil yep. yes phil yep judy yes mary yes damien yes Keith? Yes. Missy? Yes. Olivia? Yes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, guys. Nobody wants to stay for green infrastructure. <laughs> well, we have an update on uh, Kelleher Drive, which I'm sure more people are interested in. Than That's probably. That's probably true. Yes. Great. So, so um, is here. Chris, you, Chris? Trevor, is I'm Chris... still here. I'm listening. Oh, good. Thank you. <laughs> um, is Chris, oh Chris great? Um, is Kevin would Kevin and Chris want to do an update right now? On Kelleher, is Kevin here? He um, is. Okay. I'm sorry. I can't. I I don't see everybody. So thank you. Fine, I'll start. Um, <laughs> we've been monitoring the situation at Kelleher Drive for the past several days. Cold has been an impact on installation of the culvert as well as dealing with the utilities because of the pole that's near the project. Um, Kevin's out there every day 
Chris has been apprised of most of what's going on. I hope I didn't forget anything, Chris. <laughs> but basically, we're moving forward slowly. Kevin, do you want to explain where we are as of today? And of course, he's not going to. So maybe he missed us. Um, they were working on the sewer connection and the water connection prior to dealing yeah. with, there he is, prior to dealing with further installation of footings and the culvert. Right, Kevin? Unmute yourself. <laughs> I finally got to say that. There he is. There we go. All right. Um. Yeah. Where they're at now is 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 they put a second valve in. They're they're they've decided to try and go underneath the sewer main. Um. They've got another stick of pipe they're trying to put in. They didn't get too far with it today. They should be well. They got to be ready to to change over on Friday. Um. You know they they've had some issues in the past. I think you know once once we get past this part of the pole and the water main is done the rest of it's 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 a piece of cake um you know it's just one more footing and, and finish putting in the other three pieces of culvert and backfill and and be honest with you it's going to be spring by the time they get all said and done because you're not going to get any decent cleanup now they're going to end up having to come back right. yeah. you know if, if we get any pavement down at all it's going to be binder it's not going to be finished right so there's a lot of a lot of uh Clean are up. we are we going to be able to have the leverage to get them to come back though and do the correct job, Kevin? That's what I'm concerned about. Well, yeah, you don't pay them. Yeah. If you don't pay them, then 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 if they decide to leave, then the money that you've had pulled off to the side, you give it to somebody else. Yeah, to finish out. So, so we don't we don't pay. Historically, the town, as far as I'm concerned, never pays for anything before you actually receive the service. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, so anytime that. Yes. Well, are we on the hook? Well, we have a contract and right. we have the um, Zach Cherniak and Jake from Tie and Bond that are monitoring this project very closely. And we've had that conversation with how to proceed if there's issues. Um, when we've had the utilities in to coordinate with the installation, like we did this past Monday, Zach was there and made sure discussions happened around how we were going to deal with you know, the bills we would receive from the utility company. So he also reviews all of the bills that come from the contractor and advises us as to what issues might be a problem, might be problematic, including change orders. So I think we're well placed to keep that monitoring going effectively. All right. There's going to be a few, there's going to be a few change orders, you know, it, but it's, it's not going to be much, you know, a little bit of um, extra gravel, I'm sure. Uh, the borings that originally came back, my understanding, um, they didn't really truly um, reflect what was there for soils because um, mm -hmm. the understanding was a lot of the soils are going to be able to be reutilized um, and they're not. Um, what's coming out of the hole is junk. Okay. Um, it's, it's new gravel, new stone. Um, so that's outside of the, the purview of that, my understanding. But mm -hmm. um, again, you know, that's, that's well beyond my pay grade. That is when it gets to the lawyers and it gets to the contract and they pick it apart. Um, Kevin, do, my opinion. do we still have, um, I think we pick, you know, something a little more attractive than, than just like a cement block for the end caps of the culvert uh, and walls. I don't yeah, know if that's right. on site already or, or. That seemed like ages ago. I'm sorry to say. Yeah, I'm not going to forget it because when it's done, I want it to look good. <laughs> right. So, so if you look at the upstream side, yes. those are already installed. Okay, good. If, I haven't if you want to, yeah. if you want to see the downstream side, yeah. take a ride down Kelleher. They're on the side of the road. Okay, good. Yeah, I'm glad they're there. I just want to make sure that yeah. we're. Still yeah, there's there's three more large um, sections of culvert that still need to be installed. Okay, but those can't go in until the water main is moved because they yeah. gotta they gotta hold the pole to remove the water main to be able to install the footing to install the culvert. Yeah, it's it's. So, yeah, a lot, yeah, it's a lot it's there. everything is pieced together. Um, mm -hmm. It's but that's the nature of the construction itself. Well, Deerfield's big it dig. <laughs> yeah, this is a big dig thing. I mean, I can't. I'm I'm really upset that this was not um, this worked out way before. 
Well, actually, you know, if you really think about it, this truly isn't a big dig thing because we're not spending um, billions of dollars. No, no, I meant it was, it was a big, it was we're a not big spending dig. any more money. Did it take longer? Yeah. But, you know, and to be honest with you, you know, did we go with the lowest bidder? Yes, we did. Yeah. You know, did, did we, did we throw the dice with the lowest bidder? Yes, we did because it was a substantial amount of money and we yeah. discussed this. And we said, you know what, we, we can go ahead and help them along, but it wouldn't have made a difference. No matter who you used, you they, still still would have hit the, they still would have hit the power because yep. that was not in their control. Right. They still would have had flooding because three of the storms that came through were not controllable. Did right. they have water issues before? Yes, they did. Yep. But all in all, I mean... It'll, it'll work out. It's longer. It's all going to work out in the end. Yeah, you know, I feel bad for the residents on the street that have had to deal with all of that. But um, in the long run, you know, we won't be back there again in their lifetime. Correct. It's going to be well done, <laughs> and and for a long time, that's going to work well and look good for our community. So yeah, it's never, never. You know, I mean, you you build a house, all the things never go the way they should. You think you're done in July and you're done at Christmas. You know, it's just it's a lot harder than you think sometimes, and what you run into, but. Um, I'm just confident that we have you, Kevin, and Chris, and and uh, Casey to to stay on everybody and make sure it's done right. So I'm there average probably three times a day anyway. So so I'm um, just kind of keeping an eye on them, making sure things are going along. You know, and and um, you know the engineering firm. You know, they've got the um, Jacob that's out there. You know, he does a good job. He's every yep. time you turn around, that little book's out. He's writing in it. Good. Uh, yep. You know, so he's he's doing his due diligence. So. Okay. Well, it's going to be a good test project for the Captain Lathrop replacement of that culvert. <laughs> um, you know, well, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> Did you well, see me cringe? It just let that mellow. Well, well here, yeah, here let's let me just... put it this way. If 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 we if we don't if we don't <laughs> utilize state funds, I can replace that culvert in probably two days for mm -hmm. about 10 grand. <laughs> yes, yeah, I'm saying. to that. You're on video. This is no, cool. I'm serious. A piece of pipe. You pull out a piece of pipe, piece you pull back pipe. a piece of pipe. I know. You don't go by Massachusetts storm water crossing right. regulations, which is what we abide by. And that's right. why it is so much more expensive. Well, we wanted that open bottom. Because it's the environmental end of it is where it's coming into play. Yeah. Well, we do want the, we want the open ended. Yes, Mary, I can see oh, your hand up. Thank you. So, Kevin, on Kelleher Drive, are we still scheduled for no water tomorrow? Friday yeah. is what I was told. Right? Turn down your fucking thing. Hey, come on, guys. Nice language. You guys got to mute if you're going to be in this meeting, unless you're talking. Thank you. Um, um, Mary, Mary, I think it's Friday. <laughs> Kevin, is Friday. that true? It's Friday. It's not tomorrow, Mary. It's been moved a couple days. Mary, Mary you're, you're, mu you're muted, Mary. There you go. Oh, no. Nope. We okay. were told Thursday. Yes, it was Wednesday. Yeah, then Thursday. There's, 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 there's no way they're going to be ready. They they were running into troubles trying to get around the sewer. Oh, all right. There. So do the, do the residents know that? I don't think we know that. Um, somebody was supposed to go by tonight. Okay. All right. And post the, in, uh, the same letter you got saying yep. that it was going to be tomorrow. Uh, you're getting the same letter stating Friday. Okay, thank you. It's M.E. Smith is who is actually delivering and who is the contractor. So I told okay. him about it. 48 hours notice and you're going to post it. That's nothing on the town, nothing on the engineer. So um, everybody should have been contacted tonight with what I was told. Uh, Look on your doorstep, Mary. If you don't have anything, come back to the meeting and let us know so we can go after this guy again. Uh, just check your mailbox because uh, I'm not sure. I, I honestly don't know if you pound it on door or if you just put it in the mailbox. I, I truly don't know. Kevin, did you get a copy of it? I have not. No. All right. It would be nice if we could get it so we could throw it up on the website because sure. I noticed we have the notification that says Thursday. Yeah. Um, and okay. I don't have a way to make that change myself. Okay. Um, but I think it came through the water district. I, can I think the, the information I had was it came through the water district, but I think that might be whatever, whatever the company did, we should at least have that information. Casey, I can change it back into a word and adjust it and then put it up tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. You can change it. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it was, it was a little bit of an issue because it was like, 
they were supposed to do it tomorrow. Then it's like, well, no, well, we don't want to do it on Friday because something happens on a Friday, you know, then that means, okay, well, you're not working on Saturday. You're not working on Sunday. Well, Monday's a holiday. So, Hey, you know what? Maybe we'll, maybe we'll come in. We'll do it, try and do it on Tuesday, but you know, we're paying for a truck to come in and hold the pole on Monday. Um, so it's, it's, this, this thing is, it's been a moving target is what it's been, unfortunately. Yep. Um, Thank you, Kevin. Please stay on top of this. We're, we're this just trying been... to do the best we can and move this as fast forward as possible. I, I know. I'm, I'm really not trying Considering to... conditions on the ground. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to harass you, but really yep, no. have to keep following this guy. You yep, know, no, this and it's already actor. posted on Deerfield now. Thank you, Trevor. Yep, you're All welcome. Right. All right. Um, Chris, do you want to continue with a little bit more of an update? Yes. Um, so I had asked for time on the agenda tonight to talk about two other um, projects under our MVP grant, and that is the um, infrastructure policy implementation and the uh, zoning bylaw work that we're doing. Um, and part of the reason for for asking is that we've been um, we've been asked to participate in a statewide um, conference uh, video conference on implementing nature based solutions. And we're going to be talking about the, the town's work on these two areas. Uh, there's already something like 250 people signed up for this, and uh, they want to be interested in what Deerfield is doing and want to use our work as um, kind of a model for. Great. So, That's great. Uh, so it's good in, in that sense, but we have some preparation to do in advance of this. Uh, it's a January 21st uh, webinar. Um, so to quickly update you, uh, I've been working pretty actively with the planning board uh, on several issues related to climate involved zoning. One is uh, we're working on a revised uh, solar zoning bylaw that will sort of clarify the by right solar uses and make some other changes to streamline the, the solar zoning a bit. We're also working on um, a set of green development performance standards to be adopted as part of the town's site plan review process. And uh, so the planning board's been very actively engaged with, with those things. And uh, we hope to have both of those ready for spring town meeting, which will be important again, to show our progress on, on this part of the grant. Um, the other piece is that we, you all last April adopted a, um, a new policy, a town policy on green infrastructure and climate resiliency. And uh, we are going to be reporting about that as well and its implementation. Um, that is an area that I think we're lagging a bit behind on. And um, that's one of the things I wanted to kind of bring to your attention and ask for your input on tonight. Um, we talked uh, back at the time it was adopted about uh, setting up a, a coordinating committee for this policy. and. Um, having regular monthly meetings. And I think we need to um, think about moving forward with that. Obviously with COVID, we got set back a bit. Um, but uh, we talked about establishing a committee that would use our existing MVP core group as a kind of a foundation and, and perhaps expand that out a little bit. Um, and my suggestion to you and ask, I guess, is whether we could uh, actually um, formally establish that committee and establish the membership of it. Um, but, and is there a charge that we could read? Um, I, I don't know if you would put a, a you know, a kind of a, a template of a charge or something you had in mind for that. I, I can't remember if it was in the, in the language that we adopted or not. It's in, it's in the policy. Okay. Yeah. So I can go back and look at that. Yeah. Um, all right. So in terms of, um, Membership, just my suggestion to you, again, we, we have a core group that consists already of um, Carolyn from the select board, Casey and Jennifer, uh, Chief Pachorek. Uh, we have now added um, from the Energy Committee, M.A. Swedland and Lori Busada, uh, Kevin Scarborough, Lori McComb, and Tim Hilchey from, from Conservation. Um, I think to, to get the full complement of what we need is, uh, it would be helpful to have a planning board member and someone from the building department as well uh, on the group. And then to really try to, to begin uh, a schedule of regular meetings to, um, to try to advance some of the work that we've talked about. 
So um, my suggestion is to is to establish that group and formally appoint folks to it. Um, and then um, I want to talk to you a little bit about progress to date because I'm supposed to be reporting on that at the statewide forum. Okay. But you want to talk about that first issue? Carolyn, you're muted. Sorry. I apologize to the Energy Committee where we got behind. Um, this would just take a few more minutes. Um, so let's so a couple of things I wanted to talk about a, a bit or, or a question was uh, on the solar bylaw. Um, is there still uh, are you is that still before the planning board and still open for public discussion? Yeah. Okay, good. So right. I had one issue with it. I just wanted to talk about, uh, but I don't need to do that here at all. Um, and then, and then I guess I, I would, you know, I could, you know, make a motion to move forward with that, um, with that uh, committee. I, I did want to just maybe do that vote on that next meeting so I could have a chance to review that charge and then maybe take a look at maybe we could compile names so that at next next meeting we could vote on who would be on that board. Um, okay. Just kind of put all that together to get it done next meeting if that would work. Yeah, that'll be uh, that'll be after the statewide forum, but I can at least report that we're making progress on that. Yeah. Okay. So the, the other thing, and I know your your time is short here, um, but I just needed to check in with you about is we should be talking at this forum about examples of progress to date that the town's been making um, policy. And, uh, you know, we do have the culvert projects, we do have the tree box filters and, and the work on the zoning. But beyond that, I guess I'm wondering, you know, if, if folks are aware of other things that are consistent with the policy that we, we can we can add to that list. Um, so example might be, have, has the town been doing any work on uh, looking at electric vehicles or charging station? Um, yeah. Okay. Yes, and, and, and the energy committee could, could and Lori's oh. online too, can talk about that as well, if you want. They're here. Yes, yes. they're here and can participate. Well, we, we actually got grants to do those, the charging stations, Chris. Okay. Yeah. And that's moving forward. Um, we did do some before COVID hit. We were trying to do some public outreach with um, dragonflies and working with local businesses, um, Chapel Heath Gardens, to provide plants um, for people's backyards to promote dragonflies to eat mosquitoes um, as an alternative to, um, you know, lava siding. And certainly as an alternative to spraying, since. Um, mm -hmm. Our district is very much against spraying. We're trying to do preventative stuff. So um, we'll have more educational outreach through the Mosquito District. We formed this Mosquito District. We're active members and um, we're trying to, you know, reach out to people as much as possible on, from an education point of view. Um, so, you know, just to kind of focus on what's actually in the policy that the Mosquito District isn't really part of it, but um, the EV charging stations are um, electric or hybrid municipal vehicles. We um, have a hybrid. We, we just got one. Yeah. Uh, police cruiser. One of the we were the first, we were the first agency, Back police in. agency in the state to change to hybrid police cruisers. That's excellent. We're the second. We're, we're putting a solar array on the, on the landfill. Yep. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Ma, you had a, you added something to add. Mute. Oh, you're you're muted. Up, you're muted. Ma. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, the uh, through the Green Communities Grant, we are purchasing and replacing all of our or 99 percent. I'm not sure if it's 100 percent, but 99 percent of our street lights with L LED lights. Yeah. Excellent. That's and, in yeah. that's in the policy. And the year before we did the Green Communities Grant to do the uh, boilers over at the elementary school and a bunch of different lighting in, in, in the elementary school as well. Okay. Yeah. And when you say boilers, <laughs> can you be more specific about what, what happened with the boilers? 
Oh, so uh, David, maybe want to speak to that because he was very involved with that yeah. grant. Um, they, the elementary school had two huge boilers and really only needed to run one of them most of the time. And the um, building utilities man, um, whose name I should know and have forgotten. Yeah, Bill Hildreth. <laughs> it's Bill now. Um, it wasn't then, but um, Bob. MA would know. It was Bob Lesko. The gist yeah, of it was that, that if we could get smaller um, gas burners, they could be stepped up as needed instead of just cranking away with a giant one and, and upgrading all the pumps and things that ran the hot water heat through the school um, would uh, save a lot of energy. Yeah, it was a major, because we're really the big one, just we never needed really the whole big one except for a couple times of the year. And then if we had to run the second one, it was just way overkill. So this gave us a lot more flexibility to, to cycle between two smaller ones as needed. We calculated for the grant that it would be a savings of 5% of the total town, the municipal energy use mm -hmm. could be saved by being able to step that gas burner. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And of course, you're aware of all the, you know, the, we applied for grant for the, you know, green parking and that kind of thing, but, um, and, and hopefully right. as we start to do complete streets and all we'll tie in all of these items. I, I know I know what you're talking about, Chris, is not the Mosquito District, but the Mosquito District was a goal that we did achieve. And then and then it is doing um, part of that climate change stuff. So um, I want to make right. sure we get credit right. for it because we're I'm just... for the lead community. Yes. <laughs> not a meeting on mosquitoes. There, there's some very specific uh, bullet and points in the in the green infrastructure policy that that you all adopted that i'm just trying to kind of get a, do a kind of a checklist of where we're at with yep. um, <laughs> Did you the have governor any... changed the mvp program just for our mosquito district by the way too <laughs> wow yeah you can pay you can pay it now through the grants okay so is there anything else you can think of um in that area that progress that we've made. How far back are you going in relation to progress? Um, just to, just till last April. <laughs> <laughs> they made other progress, but yes, I was just looking at the policy myself. So I'll print it for you, Trevor, and leave it in okay, your box. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank what you. do we call the committee, Chris? Um, I think we call it the committee. The Green Infrastructure Policy Coordinating Committee. That's a long title. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we can shorten I'm it. I'm putting it on an agenda. Maybe something shorter. <laughs> Yip it. <laughs> yes, there will be an acronym. <laughs> yeah. Gene, gene community or whatever. We're going to have to figure something out. No one will remember that. Okay. Green, green Infrastructure Policy oh. Committee. How many, how often do you feel like this is going to meet, Chris? Um, I, I think we've committed to meeting monthly. Okay. All right. We need to make sure you put that in, Casey. It is. I just put it on. It's probably a monthly commitment. Okay. Chris, um, evil. Is there anything else, Chris, that you want to talk about? No, I know you're behind schedule, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Appreciate the time. Um, Thank you. If you want to come to our um, meeting on the 27th, you could tell us how you did on, on the um, webinar. Okay. And maybe we can get the uh, committee established at that point. Yes. Yep. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm next on our agenda is the Energy Resources Committee. Um, and I'm hoping you guys would be able to talk about the next stamp community letters that are going out. I think there's some confusion. 
I may have sent a nice email kind of capturing that. When she's unmuted, she can tell us about it. <laughs> yes, there I am, unmuted. Um, okay. Let's, let's see. I did send out a, a, a gra uh, chart. Yep. But, but first, I wanted to say that basically what Nexamp does is use something called a Schedule Z, which is a way of transferring uh, energy credits from one person to another. So if I, or one organization or whatever, so it's good for me, it's good for Nexamp. So, and it's state law. Um, and what happens is if I am producing more electricity than I need from my solar, uh, I can fill out, it's very short form and submit to Eversource a Schedule Z and that means that some percentage of the electricity that I produce is then transferred to somebody else. Mm -hmm. uh, can be anybody in the Western Mass right now. It's in the Eversource Western Mass district. So if I wanted to give Carolyn some energy of my energy, I would fill out a Schedule Z and 10% of my energy I produce each month would, she would get credit for on her Eversource bill. And they monetize it and give her, you know, a hundred bucks for the 10% of energy that I have given her. And that is deducted from her bill. So it's deducted from the whole bill. It isn't just the amount of, from the supplier. It's a, a dollar amount that's deducted from your bill. And that's exactly what Nexamp does. They you sign up that what you do is you're going to give them uh, your energy, your electric bills for a year. They'll say, this is how much you use. We're going to cite, we're going to put you in for this much. And then you would get that credit on your bill. It's a dollar amount redu uh, reduced your bill. Then next amp will send you a bill and that bill will be 12 and a half percent less than your than ever the Eversource bill would have been. So um, whatever 12 and a half, 80, 87% and $87 if it was a hundred dollar bill, you would have to pay to Nexi. So you get two bills, but it's 12% off. So the thing is, is that it works perfectly with Dynagy. So if if you did sign up for for it, it it still would come off your Eversource bill. You get a you, your your Dynagy is cheaper than the Eversource, and then you'd still get yeah there it is. Then you'd still get um, uh, a twelve and a half percent reduction from your bill. So on this graph, um, what the farthest column to the right is how much each of the different um, choices that the town the town residents have uh, for the three year contract that we have with Dynagy and then also with Eversource. So if you if you just did the default ones, you're five percent less at uh, five percent more green energy than Eversource. Uh, that costs you. Uh, 0 0.9432 uh, dollars, so nine cents a kilowatt hour. And if, uh, so that your your average bill from Dynagy would be $57 that month. Oh, this, this is for a total, an average amount, which most households for 600 kilowatt hours a month. So that's the average household usage. So that's the, that's the number that we're using on this graph. So 600. So, so the 0 0.9432 times 600 comes out to be uh, $57. And then with the additional delivery charges that Eversource um, charges, your bill would be $134.59. But if you sign up for Nexamp, that that would be reduced by 12.5%, which is $117. So the two programs work really well together. Yeah. And uh, and there's and with with Nexamp, there's no contract. There are no penalties for 
stopping or, or starting. Um, and they are guaranteeing that for as long as the program, the solar array that you sign up to be part of is in, is in place so that the, the collectors are still there, you will have that 12%, 12.5% 12 less than Eversource. And it's based on what Eversource is charging at that time. Eversource goes out twice a year uh, to bid and it, their numbers change twice a year. Um, but it's, but so that's, that's what it's based on. Sounds like a great, great opportunity it, for it's people. It's a totally good idea. Um, to, and the, the problem is, is that the ones that we would be, that would be available for us are right now in Conway and in Waitley, and they're both fully subscribed. Yep. And we have so, new ones coming online eventually. I'm sorry? Uh, do, we do have, NextAmp does plan on having new arrays coming yes. online, correct? And, yeah. and I, th what they said to me was, or somewhere I heard, I can't remember who said it, but that the soonest it would possibly be would be the fall of 2021. Okay. Uh, however, um, I don't know. I mean, then we get into the fact that NextAmp is planning and hopefully goes ahead with developing our landfill. Right. And um, when I talked to the to Keith at NextAmp or uh, text uh, emailed with Keith at at, at NextAmp, he said that he was quite anxious and free and does talk to communities about prioritizing members of the community uh, so that right. so that they, that we could sign, you know, that we can get our Deerfield residents prioritized on the Deerfield plan, uh, so solar array. And that's great because I mean the whole idea is that there are a lot of people in town or they, they can't want to afford you know, to put on a solar array or don't have a location. Maybe they're in a valley, they don't get any sun, there's too many trees. Here they can take take part of an, in a 100% green, you know, class one right. solar and, um, and, and get some benefit from that. So I'll stop sharing now for everybody. No, um, but that's- How, that's... how do we, um, how do we help residents make this, you know, help them think this through MA? Well, it's going to, it's interesting. You can sign, I mean, the same deal. If you, if you sign up for this now, or you wait to be prioritized to the, for the Deerfield one, I don't know. I, I don't know when you would actually get to participate. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, NextAmp isn't saying, well, we're signing up people right now for, uh, and it'll start in such and such a, you know, on yeah. in September. Um, they're, they're, being, they're being a little vague about it. Uh, so, but I didn't try it. I know Lori tried to sign up. So I, maybe they've told her something. Um, I don't just think. Says, it just says that I'm on the wait list. So yeah. I mean, we, we, we talked briefly about doing some kind of mailing from the energy committee. Um, and I guess we just have to clarify exactly what we want to talk about because we do have to share information about the um, Street lights as that moves on, right? Yep. And um, you know, I I talked it over the next end thing with a couple people. Ran a lot of questions by them. It seems like um, I, I don't see any. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't see any catches. It seems it seems like what it is. <laughs> um, right. The only the only little bit of a catch is that if you decide to put up a big solar array yourself or whatever and to withdraw from the program you um six months but you know it would take you yeah. that long to get it organized anyway but sure and that six that six months is a schedule z regulation it's not next year. Yeah. yeah okay um tim has a question hey tim just to clarify um so um we have a 41 panel solar array on our house. Can we participate in next amp or not? Yeah. So what they, they do is you give them your um, access to your Eversource bill and they estimate based on your yearly usage, how much, how many solar panels they would allocate to you. And then they give you so many credits um, and your usage can fluctuate throughout the year, but you would use the, the you would have the credits available all year. So hopefully it evens out with the, in the course of the year. 
So the credits mean my average monthly bill would be a certain thing? It's, um, this is MA. Um, it, it ends up being uh, exactly the same as, you, as you'd get with your solar panels. It's as if you had, it, it, you're, you're just in, with the Schedule Z, you're just increasing the amount of solar that is credited to your bill. So if you have no bill, you get, if you have no, if you, if you produce more than you use, you have no bill, but you will get credits. So I have solar on my roof right now. I have a thousand dollars worth of credit. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with it, but, but uh, some, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an electric car. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, okay. You know, so it's exactly the same as if as if you have solar panels, you know exactly how it affects your bill. It's exactly you'll just get more credits or you'll reduce your bill and you can use it winter. You can, you know, in other words, you can use your credits in the winter. Mm -hmm. Right. OK. I think if we get the go ahead from the select board to talk to Keith at Nexamp, they would help us. I think I read that he said they would put together a mailing on town letterhead that we could send out. Um, so it goes yeah. along with the timing of um, the Deerfield landfill, I would, yeah. I would guess. Right. So yeah, I think it's really important that we have some explanation for people because you yeah. know people wanted, were worried there was a scam, whatever. Right, yeah. yes, so, David, David, go David. ahead. David. Yes, uh, this is David, Energy Committee. Um, going back to Carolyn's point that, that uh, I think a lot of the confusion in town is that people are getting a lot of mailings from different companies at the same time we're doing aggregation mm -hmm. and adding this potential savings through our own solar array or Nexamp's solar array on our landfill. Yeah. So uh, I'm hoping that we can do kind of a, a mailing that can help clarify that the two town sponsored things, yeah. recommendations are, are different from all the other myriad of things they're getting in the mail and yeah. by phone, they're getting phone solicitations sure. too. I agree, David, it, it does make sense to um, uh, boil this down in something simple, clear graft or some, some sort of one page thing that we could, you know, push out on the website and then, you know, either do a mailing through with Nexamp or through the energy committee. Um, it, I think it's worth educating. There's a lot of smart people that when it comes to solar, they glaze over it. and mm. there's so many different uh, options and it, it's, it can be confusing for a lot of people. And it, I think if we I could totally zero that in for, you know, just zeroed in, it would be really helpful to the residents. And I, um, so the energy committee would like to know how we go about doing a town mailing. We have money in our budget, mm -hmm. so we can pay for it, which may relieve everybody's anxiety. Um, but we don't know how we go about that. So who do we talk to? And I mean, and, and who do we need to run it by, run the documents by? I think um, the select board, we would want to just look at it before it goes out, right? Just to approve and, and you know, just make sure all, all things are legal and all of that. Um, and then, um, I, I, you know, I, I'm not sure if Barb, you know, would have the, you know, the town mailing list, you know, as the tax bills go out, that kind of thing. Um, we might we can it. probably get a list from Barb, but we yeah. may want to consider using a mailing company because right. it would be very time consuming to fold and, yes. and do all that. But also yeah. with a mailing company, they sure. often have a stamp, the nonprofit mm -hmm. or the, the decreased cost for a mailing. There's a stamp that you can get. And I know there's at least one company around here that has helped the town with that before. Okay. Yeah, that would, that would be wonderful. I mean, do we want to get on a future select board meeting to, um, and invite Keith from Nexamp to talk about an arrangement with the town, or do we need to wait until the landfill is further along? No. Uh, Casey did tell me that we have a contract, which is oh. very exciting. We have two documents I'm waiting for. <laughs> wow, that is very exciting. Casey, do you have any information about where they are with the Eversource permitting? So they've completed um, part of the work to get to the permitting. 
they there's a study they have to do prior to applying for their connection um so we had to finish the contract and that took a lot longer than any of us anticipated now that we've got the contract and i've emailed out the the scan of it to everybody i'm just waiting for two pieces of information back from them um they were going to start to move ahead i don't have a timeline from them so it's that's an email to Ben Axelman and ask him where they are with that. But that was their next step is once they got past the study, they were gonna start the um, interconnection paperwork and application. Oh, so they haven't even applied? They couldn't until we had the contract settled. Okay. So, so the way I understand it just, and I could be wrong about this, but um, in order to even get in the SMART program line, all those permits have to be complete and that Eversource usually takes about six months to complete their study. Yeah. So um, we're talking, we're talking probably, I mean, you know, at least, I mean, if we're lucky, another six months before we even get in line for the SMART program. I don't know where they are with the study though. So I can I can send an email to Ben yes. and ask. I mean, for I know they started they started that process before they did the contract. So they they'd started that. So if the clock is ticking on the six months, we might be a lot closer. If the clock isn't ticking on the six months, Stacy, you know. can you just check that out because yep. Um, yep. this has been an incredibly frustrating process. Um, uh, just backing up backing up to the mailing, yep. we would contract with someone to do it is that what i just heard i think it would be more cost effective yeah. otherwise you'll all be in here stuffing envelopes i i it's not there. a safe thing i and, think and that was that was my question is we yeah. use the stamping machine and stuff and then right and so what we would do is we would contract with a mailing service and they produce whatever is approved yeah. we give them that information and they produce the mailing and send it out using their um, reduced cost stamp because it's all the same piece of paper right. and it's something that the town doesn't have you have to actually get one from the usps mm -hmm. um, so typically when we have a large mailing we will do something like that tax bills we don't do that with but we do do it with because the information is different in each envelope but for something like this we may have that availability that would be my suggestion great um, so the energy committee will go to work on documents and okay as soon as we have them, um, we will get them to the selectmen. I don't, I think we should probably check and see if we have to run it by the DPU through Colonial, but I will check on that. I think that would be, I was thinking about that while you were talking, MA. We probably need to know that. Yeah, I'll check, I'll check with Colonial um, to make sure. Go ahead, David. Um, I, don't, I don't want to tie up a lot of time on the nitty gritty, but but just one more question. Last time we did this, a zillion of the envelopes came back with the addresses we were given. And I think it was largely because there were renters who were not in charge of their own utility purchasing. And I don't know what we do about that. I don't know that we have a way to weed that out because it's not in the, it's not in the resident list. Yeah. The residents are the residents. And that's lar That's often the place that we get the information, David. So right, we, that that's be the tax, whatever we mail a tax bill to, right? That's the owner. Typically, but yeah, some we, it's very difficult for us to weed out the information of a renter versus an owner if we're yeah. using the resident list, yeah. not the tax list, but the resident list. That's yeah. often what you use is the resident list. Okay. If you use the tax list, would it be more accurate? I don't know. It's actually a question for Barb. Yeah, whether it legally we can too. Right. I don't know if you can. I'd actually have to ask her that. Yeah. yeah. Might be a requirement thing. So do we want to um, go forward with talking to Keith from Nexam um, on behalf of the select board or arrange a time for him to talk to the select board so that we can establish that we want Deerfield residents to have a priority when our landfill solar array gets set up? I think we need to know if there's an intersect with Dynergy first or Colonial. And I need to know how, understand the process that NextAmp is going to be using for the solar landfill. And I'm writing an email. 
Right. But before we settle on a date, I don't know that we have all the information we need, Lori, is what I'm saying. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm just nervous about sending out a, a mailing before we get I don't think we right. should send out a mailing until we have a little. So MA is right. going to check with Colonial. Um, and I can ask the question about the list that we use to develop the mailing. Um, but without a better understanding from Nexamp as to where they are in the process, I don't think we can schedule a meeting with Keith well, because you've got different entities in Nexamp handling this. So yeah. the contract piece is different from what right. Keith is doing. Yeah, I have one, one comment. I would say that um, in relation to asking, I think they're two separate issues because we don't know, they may have other things, other uh, arrays coming online that people could qualify for before they before we talk about you know being prior you know getting a prioritized for Deerfield residents. So I think the two, I think we can send out something about Nexamp is good. If you want to sign up for it and get on the waiting list like you did, Lori, that's great. Uh, if you want to and and then and then at some point in the future we can say Deerfield residents will be prioritized. But I think they're two separate things. And I'd like to get something out about Nexamp and the aggregation stuff sooner rather than waiting until we hear from, you know, figure out all the rest of the stuff about the landfill. Because that- So I think that means a generic, well. a more generic mailing. Right. Yes. It will Dave, be. are you okay with that? Because um, I don't know what kind of questions you've been getting. I haven't been getting a lot of questions on it, I, other than the fact that people are getting mails, mailings on it and under, Trying to understand what it is. My understanding was was possibility from the set right solar array. That's why they were soliciting Deerfield right now. Is so is sure. next is Nexamp doing that one? I thought so. I don't know. Yes, it is. Okay. Yes, they are. So they that, that, array. that that one will come online way before ours. So that's what I'm thinking. That's why I keep thinking you might have to do a set right because they we finished up that particular array and then found out within a few days that Nexamp actually owned that array. <laughs> and, I, and I've been watching it because I've been walking over on, uh, on um, Sand Gully and they are making major progress on building. They that. are, yep. Yeah. So maybe we can get Deerfield residents prioritized on that. And that's another conversation with Keith. So we'll, we'll we, I think we, uh, well, let me ask this question. Would the selectman like the energy committee to talk to Keith and get back to you about what he's doing or get, have that initial conversation or would you like him to come in and talk to you? Uh, no, I, I, I'm just, I'm fine to have you do that, MA. And okay. make sure, what we're trying to do is con convey the information to the community right. in, a, in, a, in a way that's clear and, 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 and some kind of timeline so people understand. Um, I know you had your hand up, um, Gary Weldon's. Yeah, it's um, actually Steve. Steve. Iper. <laughs> My wife's iPad. Sorry about that. I can't yeah. change it. Um, just a quick question. I mean, do you understand uh, which solar way, arrays we can we can jump onto for this community shared solar? In other words, they they have they have they're doing this all over the state, of course, or all over the all over the region. Yeah. Does it have to be something in our area, or can it would it be, have to be it would have to be in Western Mass in the Eversource Western Mass, which is a pretty broad area. So there, there are likely to be lots of other opportunities before ours comes on. Then. So long, yeah. Depending, <clears throat> on, I don't know what Nexamp is doing. I know they're really they're doing a lot of work out here. So right, right. I don't okay. know. I don't know what that order is. And Keith would be able to probably help clarify all that for us. Yes. I would suggest. I would think that that will be very helpful, Ma, yeah. because I think there's a huge amount of confusion on this, and right. I. Um, feel totally unqualified to give anybody any clarifying information. So well, um, it would be we very get, helpful. The sooner we get this mailing out, the better it'll be, I think. And, and as soon as we have permission, we can also put it on Deerfield Now on the town website um, and, and also get out a mailing. But the, um, I would suggest that, that the Energy Committee invites Keith to participate in our next meeting, which is the 20... Eighth, maybe something Eighth, like I that. I think, yeah. Yeah. So we should we should be able to have some clarifying information by then. Great. Great. That would be really great because I think most people are 
generally confused as to what's happening. And if we can save people from jumping onto ones that have huge um, contract obligations, it'd be really nice. Yes. Thank you, MA. Thank you, Energy Committee. I think that's wonderful. Um, and I really look forward to um, hearing from you further and as most of the communities, I think, because um, there was really quite a lot of questions. And, mm -hmm. and, and you can refer people to me if, or other people on the Energy Committee. No, no, all to MA. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to make it confusing, MA. <laughs> well, what we can do, MA, is if people um, have questions from tonight uh, or, or people that had questions that, you know, had like called me or whatever, they can, we'll, we'll connect them with you so that they can ask you immediately what's happening because some right. of it was, you know, they wanted to make some decisions. So right. this may help them decide to, to go ahead with some of those decisions or to wait. So um, that would be very helpful if you would be willing to talk to a few people. My, my general suggestion or advice right now would be there's not a huge hurry since you're only going to get on a waiting list. Um, you can sign up for NextAmp. There's no harm in doing it, or you can wait. Uh, but either way, we should have information out, you know, by the end of February, that mailing and, and things a lot sooner than that uh, on the website. And we should have some clarification. But the only thing we're talking to Keith from NextAmp about is whether Deerfield residents can be prioritized. So okay. the rest of the information is already knowable. Okay, great. MA, would you be willing to um, have people contact you through the extension that we set up for you folks? Yeah, but you need to, I, I tried getting it. You have to fix it. Ah, okay, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> so if, if that gets fixed, that's fine with me. And I'll check okay. it regularly for a while. I, I sort of got bored with it, but. I, okay. I just wait for Jen to tell me it's blinking. I'll remind you. I'm driving her nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you. Is there anything else you um, uh, all would like to update us on uh, before you finish? That was it. Okay. Thank you for doing such great work. Really yeah, appreciate, appreciate it. Appreciate all your work. Thank you. Well, thank you all. Um, next item on the agenda is select board announcements. Um, we have the Heart for Heroes Luminary Night um, that the Deerfield Recreation Committee is sponsoring. It's February 14th, which is a Sunday, uh, Valentine's Day, about five o'clock. And you, um, it's, this is going to be um, light up our walkways and driveways with luminaries. You can get luminaries from the um, 10 bags and 10 tea lights for $10 from the recreation department if you don't have your uh, your own. And what it is is just to say thank, thank you for all those that have done so much this year and um, to light up our community um, for all those um, wonderful people. So yeah, it's been a tough it. year. It's a follow-up of keep the deer and deer field lights and Christmas and lights. That we yes, have. Sue did a great job. Um, you know, I know she was interviewed and she was in the paper, I think on Monday's paper about this program. And it's a nice way to say thank you. And we do still see the hearts, you know, early on in the COVID um, times, people were putting, you know, uh, hearts out on their front lawn to say thank you to the first responders and everybody that's, um, everybody's on the COVID front line. And it's just a nice way to, to do that, to, um, to partake in that. So Thank you, Sue, for doing that. And I hope everybody participates, so. The other yeah. announcement I have is we're going to, on the 19th, continue our discussion. Uh, this is at six o'clock, six to eight. Um, so another Zoom meeting on the parks. And the reason um, we're doing this is because we really didn't have enough time to talk about it um, earlier. And it's very difficult to have really good conversation with so many people on Zoom. And so we want to have an, a continued um, discussion on this. So that's next Tuesday, six to eight. Um, Dave or Trevor, did you have any other announcements? Well, just uh, want to update people a little bit on the sewer project. Um, Casey and I had a meeting. We have, we have a weekly or biweekly meeting with um, 
our core group, um, you know, just updating people, uh, getting updates and discussing where we're at with phase one of the uh, wastewater treatment improvement project. Um, so our, um, we, we've had bids out right now for equipment uh, for some of the items that are will be going into phase one. And I think those bids were due today at 10. Um, so we probably got some material there. There'll be a committee that comes together to evaluate and grade those uh, those bids. Um, and then we're setting up, you know, the bid for, for we hope to go out to bid. I know Casey will uh, hit on this a little bit later for the USDA stuff that we're working to get our, all that application stuff done. Um, to be ready to go out to bid in a couple of weeks for the construction of phase one. That's the 11, roughly $11.4 million um, first phase of the project. Um, but based on, you know, if anybody's had any work done or tried to get a contractor at their house in the last seven months or so, <laughs> good luck. Um, so the, the market is really kind of crazy right now for bids. Contractors are very busy. Um, looking at different projects around the area that are happening right now, similar to our project, the bids are coming in high um, just because, you know, material is very expensive. Steel has gone through the roof. Um, all kinds of materials are either hard to get because of COVID and the plants are shutting down or whatever it might be. But um, and then also contractors are very busy, so they don't need to. Uh, they're not as hungry for the work. Um, so what we did in anticipation of that is to do uh, six bid alternates. Um, I think mistakes have been made in the past on other projects um, around the area where everything was kind of put into one bid. And so we wanted that flexibility to be able to take away and add different alternates to, um, to make the project affordable. Um, so the bid alternate alternates will be uh, the base bid, which is obviously the, you know, the majority of the stuff. Um, then the alternate one, number one is a plant watering system. And that's kind of what washes um, the screen and, and there's pumps and stuff that go into place to kind of deal with that headworks uh, program. So that's something that could hold off a little bit. Um, the grit removal system is, is alt number two. Um, alt number three is the, um, the second clarifier, you know, so, we have a clarifier, it's new. Um, we just remodeled the whole thing and it's all up and running. And we do, we do still are, have up and running or ability to run and transfer the rectangular clarifiers that you know we brought up online so that we could bypass it, the system and build that clarifier. So if we had to, we could hold off on that clarifier till phase two. Um, the, all number four would be, um, the slug pumps for the you know return uh, sludge pumps. So when we return that sludge back, um, if we're not going to do the clarifier, we could hold off on that. Um, alternate five is the UV system, the sanitation system. Um, so again, we have to do some of these things, or else it isn't worth going ahead with these others. So they're all laid out actually in progression of what's needed next. Um, and the last item was the scum mixer, um, and and so that's. Again, these are all technical terms. Sound they don't sound technical, but scum mixer really is, um, and it's kind of how you how you mix stuff before you send it off. You know, there'll be I don't know if there's discussion tonight, but you know, we just got the bids for uh, getting rid of our sludge. Um, you know, Lowell is the only place in the state or in probably in New England right now that is taking sludge. That is the uh, kind of after we dewater. And um, it's all the bug waste, all the stuff that we can't process and doesn't go out to the river, the water, it's all the stuff left behind goes into a sludge, sludge um, retention system and that gets pumped out every several weeks. Uh, depending on the loads that are coming in, we have to pump and get rid of that stuff. Every, every two weeks when I sign the warrant, it's a, you know, a eight, $10,000 bill just to, to lug that stuff out to uh, Lowell and get rid of it. So anything, you know, all of these improvements that we'll be doing at our sewer plant is to reduce how much sludge, you know, one that comes in that we can get catching that headworks program and get out. Um, so the less stuff that we have to ship out, the more money we save in the long term. But that bill for um, for sludge is going through the roof. I mean, it's up sixty one percent over last year. So FY twenty two is sixty one percent. Uh, there's only one other plant and they're full. So there's nobody else to take this stuff. Um, right. And there's nothing else you can do with it. So you you were kind of, you were stuck. stuck paying the bill. 
And so anything we can do to reduce that, which is why we're, redu why we're doing all this work, but um, just want everybody to understand when Kevin goes to put his, put his budget together for FY22, sludge is gonna be through the roof. Um, it, it's, almost, it's more than double, you know? Um, so anyway, so that's kind of where we're at on the project right now. The plans are, are almost done, um, are pretty much done. We have these bids kind of laying out uh, that should go out in the next couple of weeks. And, and Casey has been working really diligently with for a second time because all the stuff got lost on USDA's uh, dime um, was to get all the information that they need to, for, to allow us to go out to bid and to um, to be so so eventually we can we can be granted the loan and and the grant money for the project so um, so that's it that's where we're at on that I don't have anything to add okay um, are are we going to have any issues with the transition um, from one group to another here. With all our paperwork transition oh for usda yeah no i mean the the big problem was that they lost you know from from when uh when the other person was running the program to this person um, it didn't felt, transfer yeah they internally didn't. at usda I, not from I, us but from them and i think okay. your question carolyn is maybe i'm reading into it is with a uh, change in a biden administration what are we going to have you know th these are politically appointed things usually that's based in Washington, you know, everything used to be much more locally. So our facility, you know, that we have in, in Amherst Hadley, um, you know, when we go to apply, a lot of decisions were made there. Um, but everything has been really migrated to Washington, D.C. So any changes, um, any anything that rolls out is all based out of Washington. Um, yes, there, there could be a difference. There could be my hope I think the people that are working that we're working with, Jennifer, will still be there working. Um, she's kind of yeah. the person on the ground doing that. My real hope is that we finally get an infrastructure bill. We get an administration. That oh, I, I agree. I, we will it's have an important. infrastructure bill and Vilasac mm -hmm. is going to be the new secretary of agriculture. So yeah, I'm thinking he, he was that, you know, prior one. So yeah. um, I'm, I'm thinking that this is going to end up being actually better for us in the long run, but I, yep. um, I know NRCS is we're expecting a lot more money to be forthcoming for for projects. Um, yep. I mean, they're already even though the farm bill cycle has got we've got 18 more months on the farm bill cycle. There is anticipation for climate change and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. I just want to make sure um, we're moving ahead enough that we're we've parceled out like the increasing the sides of the tank, mm -hmm. um, all those climate change stuff has been separated, right, Trevor? Well, yeah, those were gonna, I think we're gonna be in, set in you know, on phase two. Uh, phase a lot of the stuff we're doing is, is the first phase has the, um, you know, our um, Headworks program, you know, Headworks building and all the stuff that goes along with that and the pump systems, um, all that kind of, intermixing stuff uh but yes i think when we get to raising the walls and like building up the banks and that stuff we can roll that into phase two so hopefully and and they are ready and david knows that he, any opportunity that comes up like that you know whether it be uh mvp grant or any other grants that we can separate that stuff aside okay and well, that's the main concern that. i just wanted i wanted us to be ready to bounce on that because that, yeah and phase um, and really phase two um it's not going to take much time to draw that and be shovel ready. I think it's six months we could be shovel ready for phase two even. So if there's, if there's a big project coming down the road, a lot of it is drawn already. And I mean, we, you know, we broke it in, in sections, but they almost had to draw the whole thing just to kind of get, okay. You know, I think obviously yeah. there's a lot more engineering to go when we get to phase two, but um, but they know what's going to go there. So they could, they could run pretty quick. Well, that. Anything that we can peel off is going to be an advantage to, to sewer users as well mm -hmm. as taxpayers. So Absolutely. let's just let's just pay attention and hopefully yep. that will pan out. Yeah, for sure. David, did you have any questions of Trevor on this? No, not right now. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you, Trevor. Sure. Um, is there anything else anyone wanted to say? Um, I just want to say thank you to Jennifer and um, Casey. We. Uh, we had a mild 
well, it was really a crazy scramble week after Christmas, um, but working with um, uh, the um, Lisa from the state on trying to get our, our tax situation, you know, our, you know, exemption for um, our zip code 01342 and then the waiver, um, having that gone through Department of Education and then um, getting that information there. Thank you both for making sure that happened. And then even the post office situation, um, you know, for 01373. I mean, there's some potential for some extra savings there. So thank you both for putting together that packet over the holidays. That was- It was all hard. No, it was tough. It was tough, thank you. Um, uh, then moving on um, is Board of Health. I, our numbers are still high, but um, I can honestly say it's work, a couple workplaces that had, um, that ended up in households. So, you know, um, a couple households, well, three households. So our numbers are, have not actually come down that much, but um, the community spread has been really contained from last month. And I'm so, mm -hmm. so pleased and so happy. And I know people are working very hard and please continue because it's really making is making the opportunity for the schools to stay open. We talked about sports tonight, you know, everything. Uh, it's just really important. Please wear your mask. Please be cautious. Don't go out and, and, and have gatherings and, and, you know, try to stay home as much as you can. It's, we're really, as a community, we just got to stick together and it's coming. There's light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I'm, we're a super site for South County, our Frontier EDS, we are truly the only EDS in the county that's ready to go. And so um, it looks like Hallamont and Mo uh, Mohawk are going to combine and have a site up in uh, West County. Greenfield is doing first responder clinic right now and they're moving forward to try to you know, um, set up a site in Greenfield. But we as South County have been practicing all over those years, all many, many years of volunteers stepping forward and then new volunteers this year when we did our um, clinic. So phase one is still happening, which is the healthcare workers and first responders. Phase two is anticipated in February. We're hoping more vaccine will come after next week, um, much faster and much faster clip. Um, so this might even be, that up a bit, but we have the over 70, 75 and older group. So we're gonna go for our seniors. We're gonna have a drive-through for our seniors. The catch is that we have to use the state's prep mod system. That's how you sign up. You sign for an appointment, put your insurance paperwork, everything is there. There's no hard copy paperwork. It's all done on the computer. So we have to work to figure out how to sign up, help our seniors sign up. It's very simple, but you have to be able to be online. And so we're gonna organize, we're gonna talk to Jen Bartek at the police department and the triad and the senior center, and we're gonna help seniors sign up. But we will have a drive-through for our over 75s. Um, and then, and that's changing. So it might be like 65 and older <coughs> or whatever. Who knows what it's gonna be in the next couple of weeks. But, it's at least we know we're doing our seniors and then we're gonna do the general public. Um, I don't know when the general public is right now at the rate we're going, it could be April, but I'm in hoping that this will speed up and it might be March, but we will sign up people and um, all our volunteers will be funneled through um, the MRC. We have to have background checks. We have to have training on this prep mod system and then um, we have to have be organized through the state licensed and all that kind of stuff. So we'll have a form on our website pretty soon. Um, and it's being run out over the umbrella from the FERCOG, MAPCO, the Mohawk Area Public Health Co um, uh, Coalition, and also the REPC, the Regional Emergency Planning Council. So we're working together as on the county level and um, the vaccine is complicated. Uh, the, um, the Moderna is probably what we're gonna get because we don't have uh, the ability to handle Pfizer's. Um, it 
has it comes frozen, we have to thaw it, we have to maintain it at a certain temperature, and we have to use it within 30 days. And once it's open, we have only six hours and it doesn't transport very well. So all kinds of complications. So logistically, we're working to get the schools and the teachers done. Um, over will be the over 75s. We're going to try to figure out the schools. Um, we have, of course, uh, plans to do door to door if for the homebound, but it might not make sense to have the homebound seniors. It might make more sense to do the caregivers for the seniors. Same as the schools, it might not make sense to have all the, you know, have, we all have plans for our, each building, each elementary school in the frontier, but it might not make sense to do that. We might do it on a Friday afternoon and do everybody um, at one location, or we might um, do a third, a third, of each building so that, you know, anybody that has reactions, you're not knocking out the whole school building, whatever. We have a lot of logistics to talk about, but um, we're moving forward. We're gonna use this time to get our, our volunteers trained and organized and um, we'll sort out what's happening. So I feel really, really great that um, all our hard work has been recognized and we're ready to go as soon as we know we have some vaccine. Yep. Thank you for working on that. On the yeah. uh, on the vaccines, my understanding of the schools is they're going to do just the teachers. Um, that's it's a lot of a lot of once local boards of health have the vaccine, it's up to the local boards of health. And in my mind, the janitor and um, you know person. people that are cleaning up mm -hmm. um, the schools and stuff like that are just as important as teachers. Absolutely. So your, your cafeteria staff, your custodial yes. staff, your front office staff, they have contact with a lot more children than the teachers do. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, and um, it's a lot of this is up to our discretion. And I'm, I'm very, feel very strongly that that's absolutely true, David. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we will sort that out. Yeah. That's okay. part of our decision making process. Okay. It's no good. different than how do you define first responders? And, you know, obviously I feel like anybody that is working with the public is a first responder. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's no, and there's no difference whether you are working as a, in the schools or, you know, police officer or EMT, you know, all that, the definitions, we have a lot of discretion and- Yeah, you're public facing for sure. Yeah. And so we'll make that, those decisions. Okay, very good, thank you. Yep, um, and that's why we're very happy to be recognized is so that we have the ability to make those decisions locally. Um, okay, moving on. We have, Casey, you have the USDA documents for us to sign? Yes, I have two documents. We have a loan resolution and the legal services document. Um, the loan resolution, I have an outstanding question for Jennifer Shero, who is our USDA rep, mm -hmm. that she hasn't answered for me. I think it's the right information, and that's in the packet, both of them. Yeah. Um, but we also have a legal services agreement that we have to have town council signed. So I've got that out to town council, but I filled out what I could fill out in that document. Yeah. So my question for the board is, would the select board vote to approve both the loan resolution and legal services agreement and authorize the chair to sign once we receive clarification and the document back from council? Yes, I would make that motion. I'll second it. Okay, is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye, Trevor McDaniel. Aye, David Wolfer. Aye, Carolyn Ness. Okay, thank you. Um, so you'll just sort that out, Casey. And yes, us, and I'll let uh, you know, Carolyn, when it's ready for you to sign. Okay. Um, we have next is um, uh, sewer abatements. I think I only have one. We have one for. We're we just, have one. I was waiting for a second one, so I put a, I put a plural on there. But right now we have an abatement from uh, the superintendent for irrigation at Memorial Field behind the town hall. Yeah, we did put a second meter on. So that's really, I guess that's, we're just abating the difference between what we irrigate and what we use in town hall. I think that's the difference. Okay. Um, I, I'm, are both of you comfortable with that? I'm, I'm fine with it. Yeah, 
I mean, I think that was the whole idea, right, Kevin? You have a you have a second meter out there, and we just we're abating. That's out. correct, and actually, yeah. part of the because I'm not sure if it's part of your packet, but it breaks down of what the bill was, how much the meter says that we've got, and if you look at the meter reading compared to the last couple of winters, statement saying that you're really still a little bit higher, or excuse me, a little bit for the summer, a little bit higher, but I'm believing it's because of uh, um. We, it didn't go on before this before the season is probably the easiest way of saying it. so we watered a little bit before we actually got the opportunity to get the meter in okay well four hundred and ten dollars versus six thousand dollars is a little bit different <laughs> yeah a little bit well it's you know that i've noticed a lot of people that have irrigated you know our water usage went up a ton in town last year and i would just like to have everybody kind of just recognize that and and maybe see what we can do this year. Uh, hopefully, Mother Nature watered, waters us a little bit more. I mean, we did. Have, so the issue on the on the memorial field is that DA spent a ton of money gifting the town a brand new, you know, reseeding, redoing all that. You know, and I know it's been a year or two, but uh, or maybe a year. I can't remember when they did that, Kevin. But they they did a lot of investment on that field to bring it back from what it was and. Um, you got to irritate that stuff to make sure you have a, you have a solid base. And I think Frontier kind of did the same thing. They, they did water quite a bit more uh, than last year. So hopefully coming up this year, we can go a little lighter just to save some water. Uh, well, you know, the other thing you can start looking into is, you know, think a little bit greener. I mean, we all know what the water table is in South Airfield mm -hmm. on eight to 10 feet max. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah start putting in some well points i mean i've got a well point in my backyard and that takes care of everything up behind my house yep yeah um well it's not helping the water table even by you know, having all this water being imported down from conway and and yeah. then having it's you know Sit. watered everywhere um and we could also look into yeah. you know maybe some uh, rain sensor technology so that you know we're watering as needed and not you know you know, even my irrigation at the house, I mean, I, I manually do it. I, I do have a system all set up to go, but I just, it, you know, it rains enough and it's so wet here that I do it manually, but we could look into that for at least some of our facilities and maybe Frontier, we could ask Frontier to look into that too. There is better technology out there to save water. So um, anyway, so make the motion to approve the um, uh, sewer abatement uh, application for a memorial for town of Deerfield for Memorial Hall um, to adjust the bill to four hundred ten dollars and eighteen cents. Uh, Dave Wolfman, second. Um, if there's no further discussion, all those in favor? Aye. Trevor McDaniel. Aye. Dave Wolfman. Aye. Carolyn Ness. Thank you. And I thank you. Um, Kevin, do you? Um, why don't we go because you poor thing, you're yeah. uh, here. Um, I don't want to keep you any later. Let's let's skip down to um, the. Well, let's skip down to the tree trimming. I just um, I I I know we don't have it's it's some money, but I think it's really important that we save our ash tree and that we start we we look at the arborist professional report and we start do to do as much as we can to save the trees and um, clean up a little bit at least trimming some of this around the building um, to say, you know, so there's no, no further damage to the building. I so, Kevin a little bit today about that as well. Um, and he thinks we might be able to do things more affordably than what was on the Arborist plan. Um, and I'm, op I'm definitely open to that as well. Um, and, I, but I do, I would like to move forward with like at least protecting the ash that's on kind of near the senior center, um, but uh, but have a look at. Is the white ash, are you looking at a soil management and fertilization for that? Uh, well, right. there's two, there's, there's um, the first thing is is treating it. I think it's every two years um, for the, I think there's there's an injection that goes in that tree for the ash borer beetle. And he said, if Correct. he treats it, then, and I, I think it goes under the bar. I, I forget how it went. He talked about it, um, but I would love to see that done just to save that ash tree. Um, mm -hmm. And then other than that, I think the others in the front were 
were kind of, you know, they had been hacked in half and, and were the one over by the uh, assessor's office is just about dead anyways. Um, Silver Maple, yep. which is, which yeah, is uh, poor condition. The yep. recommendation was to be removed. Yes. And the other one in the front as well uh, was, you know, was hacked in half as well and should be removed. Um, so the idea I think I'd like to say to the public is that, um, you know, I met with the arborist with, uh, with John, we walked around and looked at different trees uh, right around the center of town hall. So we have, and I mentioned this in the last meeting, but I'll just say it again for people that are new here. We've got some beautiful giant uh, pin oaks um, that are um, gorgeous trees, but they are, they are a serious risk to our building and people that park their cars and employees that work in the town hall. I mean, when we get a windstorm, um, one, we have all the leaves going onto our flat roof and plugging up our drains and are, you know, are just clogging everything. I think when these went in about 150 years ago, there was no town hall there, no school or anything. Um, but, you know, so the idea is to remove some of these trees, um, and, and to have a plan to replant with um, species that can, that can again, last another 100 years, but, but placed a little more strategically so they're away from the building. We, we love trees, we want, we want them in our area. Um, my goal would be to not just plant a small little sapling, but to invest in a good mature tree. Um, there are, you know, there are tree farms out there that have decent looking trees that you can get that are moved along a little bit faster. But um, I would like to talk with our tree guy look at the, because um, I think Kevin had got some other estimates on tree work that were certainly more affordable than, than the one uh, person that we had just brought in, but to look at where we would position some other trees, you know, the idea is that we need to repave our parking lot, the, the way the police go in and out of that building is not super safe, you know, when you come around that back side by the by the baseball field, um, our selectman's office, that back corner, the, the trees are really close and there's not enough room for, for a car to go around there safely. And the police, you know, if they're, if they're on, you know, moving to go get to a, to a call pretty quickly, it's just a, a dangerous area. We need to expand that. And the root ball is right there. And, and these trees, you just can't move. So uh, some of the trees are right in the middle of our parking lot and the, and the tar is right up around the base they're just, they don't have much time. When I spoke with the um, arborist, there's, you know, he said in, in 25, 30 years, these trees just aren't there anymore. So we should think strategically about where we, where we put trees, what we want it to look like, um, and remove them now before they either injure somebody, kill somebody, or come through our, our office onto Casey's desk or you know, I mean, they're, they're massive, massive weight. So I wouldn't mind saving what we could, um, I, I had thought we could save maybe one and cable it, um, but but um, yeah, I can be convinced that maybe we shouldn't either. So um, I do think it's worth kind of having a look at that and removing, at least getting in the budget to start to remove and trim some of the ones that we need to, and then look at saving that ash because I think it's important to keep that tree. It'll be valuable long-term as all the rest of the ash are gone. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there, but... Um, Kind of my two yeah. cents on that. Dave, do you have any comments? Yeah, well, you know, when it comes to the trees and stuff, I on our and our tree the right to see what has to be done for the town. You know, we've got to unfortunately take a little bit of the politics out of this. Mm -hmm. People don't want trees being cut down. And quite frankly, those trees aren't that old because they were, weren't there when I was in elementary school. So, you know, I, I'm old, but I'm old. <laughs> so, you know, it's, and we have to look at preserving our, our buildings and stuff. And, you know, it's, every time a tree is cut down, you're half a dozen people that are going to complain about it. And I understand that, but mm -hmm. with management, by our superintendent in the trees, we can take trees down and replant. Yes. I, I was going to say, I think it's really important that we state that we're trying to do this in, uh, uh, you know, we, in stages. If you mm -hmm. take a tree down, we're going to plant a tree. Um, but the main thing is I want to get started on, on saving the ash tree and, you know, moving forward on that, that treatment. And then, um, you know, 
we decide when we can afford to take, because it's going to co be costly to take down those trees. So, you know, we take down a tree and we plant a tree kind of thing. Well, part of my thought process, especially with the oak, is as we take those down, have them milled. Yes. Have them dry and talk to Vernon about making something for our 350th out of those oaks. Yes, I was thinking that too, or even the pavilion that we want to put at the park, you know, we could at least get the lumber out of yeah. that. You know, oh, that's a really great idea. Oh, I love it. Speaking of which, I forgot to announce that the next 350th meeting is January 25th, Monday okay. at six o'clock. So anyone right. that is interested in the 350th, be sure to step forward, but oh, honestly, guys, that's a wonderful, wonderful idea. I got to write this down so I can bring it up at the meeting. Yeah, I think it's worth doing, Dave. That makes sense. David, I love that idea. Thank you. Um, now, with, that's really now, cool. With Vern has over there with the uh, CN trophy and stuff, he did some really interesting things for us. Mm -hmm. Out of wood that was from South uh, Deerfield. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like my bar. All, it's 22 to 24 inches wide. It's all trees that were fell in Deerfield. Nice. Yep. Wow. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a lovely idea. Um, I know, I see Jennifer Remillard is on. Uh, she knows I'm writing it down, but she'll remember it <laughs> for me. <laughs> I'm going from one thing to another. So, I went and our meeting is at 6.30, not 6 o'clock. Oh, God, thank you. See, I'm so used to 6 o'clock that I didn't even get to 6.30. 6, um, 6.30 on January 25th is the next 3.50th. So, okay. Thank you, Kevin. Kevin. So is, um, am I being given direction to make sure that that's what we're doing with the yes, trees? Yes, we're going to vote right now. Okay. Uh, just to clarify, we're moving ahead on the proposal or the report of the professional arborists, um, starting with treating the ash, please, if, if um, Trevor and Dave, you agree with that. I, yeah. That's my number one priority is that we work on the ash for sure. And then we look for money to accomplish the rest of the projects. And the other thing I want to talk about trees a little bit too is that I've had residents ask me a little bit about, I mean, we could spend millions a year on tree work in town. Like um, Kevin's like, uh-huh, there is so much tree work to be done around. And, and, you know, we only have, I don't know, was it 20,000 a year we budget, if that, um, and, and that gets eaten up, not because we're doing trees that we want to, it's trees that land on somebody's yard or on the, on the car because of the storm. Like it is burnt up in no time on stuff that we don't even, we, we want to use it on other stuff, but you wind up having to do all these rem emergency repairs and, and tree work all through the year for all the storms that we have. Um, but I did just want to mention well, I had Kevin on that I've been getting um, residents on, on Stillwater have um, complained a lot about like every storm they lose power and there's quite a few trees that could be, you know, canopied or, or trimmed back along that road. And I know we talked, I think about that land that we were looking to do with uh, I, Northeast Franklin, Utility. Franklin Land Trust, yes. Yeah, on that uh, we were talking about maybe thinning some of that back to save that road and maybe bring some more light in. So there's areas of town we'd love to kind of, if, if we knew, you know, talking with Kevin and if it, if it was worth budgeting a year a little bit more in that, in one year versus the other with maybe some funds to to get started kind of bringing stuff back away from the power lines a little bit more in certain areas you'd rather do. Well, here's the thing with the power line stuff. Yeah. I mean, Eversource has got no problem whatsoever making sure if, if there's if there's areas that, that they truly have concern of, have them email me and I can forward that to Eversource. Oh, and Eversource will make sure that it's being taken care of. Oh, that's you know, great. They're, yeah. they're, they're continually going through town. Like like right now, they're still working on Lee Road. Yeah. You know, they're also working on Hillside Road. Yeah, I saw Hillside. They cleaned up the corner there right off of Maine, right? Oh, so, so I mean they they still got, you know, they're like everybody else. You know, they're backlogged by five years, yeah. six years. Sure. Um, just for the simple fact is, is, you know, they originally started the program of like the over the guard row mower program that we actually got the, the last one in Western Massachusetts. No. Um, literally the last one. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. they, they decided that it was cheaper for them instead of giving us equipment, each town's equipment to do that, it was cheaper and more effective for them to go ahead and hire a tree crew and come in and blow it back. Yep. You know, and, and a lot of these are doing the, the um, ground to sky. So before you used to have like that little edge that would go around, you know, you tree go up so far and go around. Well, yep. now they don't, it's ground straight up is, yeah. is their protocol. And that's what you see at town hall, right? And that's why those trees really should have come down instead of like half of them taken off. Half their solar panels are gone. They have no way to get energy. Um, so they really need to come down. And you'll see that right over there by Lee Road by, by the uh, transfer station too. You know, we're trying to clean up the front of the transfer yeah. station. Um, yep. You know, eventually I think what I'm probably gonna do is I'm probably gonna end up taking down all the pines because they're really not doing much. You know, yep. they're they're not providing any, 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 uh, uh, blockage for um, viewage. Yep. So that way people see it when they're going by, you know, um, I'd like to put in, you know, some arborvitaes or something like that, just, you know, try and take it up a little bit. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, cause we still are in the process of getting ready to change out the gate and we want to still move the, yeah. the traffic flow within there. So there's still a lot of trees within that area. That's still going to get, that it's going to be removed at this point. Yep. Yep. Sounds good. I just really wanted to mention that. and thank you for that. I'll relay that back to the to the residents who mentioned something about that to just give me the location and then you could forward that on to uh, yeah, exactly. You know. Okay. Yeah, because because it's it's it Eversource got nailed so bad a few years ago when mm -hmm. when they had all the trouble and they weren't able to get us back up and running quickly. Yeah. The government slapped them and they slapped them hard to the point that now they're paying attention. So now they're doing everything they can to make sure that they don't lose electricity. That's and great. They do, it really cracked me up that I, I saw these guys getting ready. Okay, well, if, if these guys are out of power for anything much more than another 45 minutes, we're bringing in generators. And I'm like, whoa. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm, they're stepping up their game, no doubt about good. it. That's good. Good to hear. Okay. So, um, so you made a motion, Carolyn, to move forward yeah. with the program, and we'll allow Kevin to adjust it as he's needed to, to do that. Um, so I'd second that motion. All right, if there's no further discussion, all those in favor? Dave Wolfram, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn S, I. Thank you. Kevin, thank you. Thank you. I know thank you've you. been wondering about that. Okay, so that you can go home tonight. Um, I mean, turn off the lights today. Um, how about, uh, do you wanna talk about Rice's Ferry and Hawks Road? Um, yeah, actually, Casey has probably got a better handle on that. Um, she's been reached out to, um, well, I, there, I'll let Casey. Okay, I'll just, it's brief. Um, Kevin had brought the question of discontinuance of maintenance to both those roads to me. And so I started to do a little, read of, a little bit of research and both on how you do the discontinuance of maintenance and the impacts of whether this would be a county road or not, because it's more complicated if they're county roads. So I don't have a huge amount to report except to say we wanted to get this on people's radar. Um, we're trying to set up a meeting with Bob Dean at the COG because he has the information on the county roads. Mm -hmm. um, and as I noted in the memo, county roads are a little more complex to discontinue maintenance if they fall within a town's purview. So I will bring more information back to you, but we're trying to figure out if it falls within that area, then we have to do a more complex process. Okay. All right. Sounds good. All right. Now, the question I have, Hawks Road, you probably have 10, 12 houses on that road, don't you? So that Kevin had Kevin had asked me the I had asked him what distance he was looking for and he said from uh, number 105 to number 255 for Hawks oh, Road and then yeah. right? Yep. Yeah, yeah, so it'd be the last house is going down the hill. The last house on the left-hand side. So from his property to Herrings on the other side. Well, that yeah. road finishes off in Shelburne, right? And I thought there Correct. was a we couldn't we could discontinue before because it went to another town or something like that. Uh, well, well, you you can. I mean, you there's can. a lot of 
can do. You just you just have to jump through the hoops. So what I'm looking at is I'm just trying to protect the town yeah. by reducing the the maintenance because otherwise, arbitrarily, if I bought a piece of property in the midway out there, and now me the town would have to spend a couple hundred thousand dollars, if not more, because it has to be passable by fire, police, and EMS. Right. Right. So, and those, so now, so now if I'm go ahead. and school bus, if you have children, exactly, you know, and, and part of the problem, especially with Hawks Road is when the gentleman tried building his house at the bottom of the hill, the last one, the town said no. So the guy brought it to land court, he won. So then the town was required to go ahead and make maintenance down at the bottom of the road. So after that, instead of making the rest of the road because they obviously they were concerned by the amount of money that was having to be spent to bring the road up to par they were concerned about the rest of the road so instead of discontinuing maintenance which is what should have been done all they did was made it a scenic route which means i can't touch a tree and i can't touch a stone wall but i can still go ahead and buy property there and have to spend a couple hundred thousand dollars to make the roadway yeah so that's, I'm trying to avoid that. Same thing with Rice's Ferry, because you've got a long section through there. I mean, granted, you know, the Chase Foundation owns majority of that, but you've got other areas that people could possibly go ahead and sell off. And if they sell off, then we as a town, we'd be required to go ahead and, and make that happen. You know, and once again, our budgets do not, <laughs> budget just isn't there to come up with a couple hundred grand to make a new road. Yeah. So that's all I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to make sure that, you know, I'm dotting my I's, cross my T's, and, and just trying to protect the liability of the town is all I'm trying to do. Okay. How about Old Albany Road, Kevin? Shouldn't we we can do that? the same thing with Old Albany, too. I mean, there's, yeah. there's, all, there's, there's, a, bunch of, there's a bunch of roads in town. Okay. Actually, there's, there's a list um, that I sent out a while ago yep. of different roads I'd like to have looked at within town um, by legal. Because um, yep. to be honest with you, or, or bring somebody else in because to try and do the research that you have to do to find out when the road was done, you know, was it adopted by the town? Was it not adopted by the town? Part of what our issue is, is we've got two books that are missing. So we've got a bunch of town meetings that aren't documented that are missing. anymore. That, you know, there's, and so if, so if anything happened within those years, it's not documented, so there's no way of proving it. So that I'm, once again, I'm just, trying to stay ahead of the curve um instead of yeah, well Casey, if, you're looking, of if you're looking into these two roads can you just look into a couple more then well, i've got a list of roads that i've already sent yeah. in yeah, so but these are the two that we're just trying to these are the two that are on my maintenance on on my radar right now because yeah. we've got people snooping around well same as no steve mills the same way um you know that that's a mud bog out there it's an old you know correct but wood out there that's that's what it was for so um and i know that when wendy was here you were working on that when i first started so we got to get back to that for sure yeah let's pursue it so um what do you want us to do on this tonight casey just i just want you to recognize that we're asking that we will come forward with discontinue of maintenance discontinuance of maintenance with at least these two roads okay. at some point once we determine the process we have to do and if we add things to it, if we have the ability to do that, we may do that. But there is a process we have to follow. And it, it after Kevin and I talked, we figured it made sense to to put the word out via the meeting that these things will could very well come up for consideration in the next several months. Okay. okay. Get good. the ball rolling is all I was trying to oh, do. Oh, Steve, yeah. I see Steve Anderson has a question. Go ahead, Steve. Yes. Um, uh, Rice's Ferry Road is a road that uh, I would be, well, um, in order to do forest management on our property, uh, a timber sale, we would need, it would be very helpful to have Rice's Ferry Road um, <laughs> not washed out so that logging trucks could get up there if I were to want to try and do a timber sale. Does this mean uh, if the road, if the maintenance is discontinued that if I needed to use that road to get- If you needed to use that road to, to to sell wood, then it would be up to you to, to maintain pay. the road to the point of making it passable for whatever you need for your commerce. Okay. Generally a skidder can get up there versus a logging truck, right? 
I mean, you know, I'm not, I don't know for sure. Uh, well, I mean, it's in, it's not washed, it hasn't washed out lately. So I think a logging truck probably could get up there, but yeah. Um, yeah, I know I before. Before I before I took over when when Hap was still here, I know that Hap spent somewhere in the vicinity of eight thousand dollars of bringing a bunch of gravel up in there to redo that road for for logging purposes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, I I I think we're we're looking generally long term, Steve. So it'll be a while still. Um. Okay, Kevin. Is there any way you could get plot that out on the town map and lead it at leave it at the town office so we could look at it? Sure. Yeah, so that's I no can, problem. Just so I can. I, I think that would be very better. helpful so people can understand what um, what we're talking about, so they have some input and the opportunity to give us input. Well, we're going to have to have hearings about it, right. Carolyn. That's well, why I know. I know, I know there's public it. hearings, but I you. Casey, the problem is, you know, you have to you have to be able to catch the, the the information. So it would be very helpful to have a map somewhere at town hall. Um, obviously, to, it's not going to help right now because of COVID. But um, have it up on our website with a tab, you know, potential roads or whatever that we're discontinuing, mm -hmm. so that people have an idea of what you know. There's a little bit more warning. There's a little bit more um, opportunity for input. For at our public hearing, that's all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'd be easy enough to do. All right. Okay. okay. Thank you. Right. Um, next item on the agenda is the town town of Hatfield's 350th re resolution. So right. we didn't do a Hatfield resolution. Thank you, Kevin. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a nice evening. Thanks, you all too. We didn't do a resolution for the town of Hatfield. COVID interrupted a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, and I've been looking for language for a resolution and haven't been able to find it. I've reached out to several town halls, including Hatfield. So what I had spoken to one of the women that was an organizer for the Hatfield 350th, when I spoke to her, she said they've they're gonna continue to do some of those activities that they weren't able to do with COVID, like the parade. And so I thought maybe it would be a good opportunity, even if it's a little late for us to do a resolution and send it over to them. The issue has been language. So I was wondering, would the board consider approving um, drafting a resolution for signature at a, yeah. once I have it compiled um, at a later date that reflects simply the celebratory aspects of the 350th for, for Hatfield? Absolutely. If you want to vote, I would make a motion to do that. I feel terrible. I know I've reached mm -hmm. out to have filled several times because I want to make sure we get their cake um, for our 350th. So I feel terrible that we never sent them a resolution even. So yep. So I'm just going to do a quick shout out to a friend of mine who's on this meeting who has a, a person who may be able to help me find this. Yeah, Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. And I, I remember early on when they, you know, they were planning all this, we were going to do, you know, a video and we were going to get together and all that stuff. And I just, I feel horrible that a lot of that fell apart for them because of COVID and uh, right. support them. We'd love to have them, you know, partake, you know, they're very instrumental in, in Deerfield, you know, they, they had the raid the same time we did. And, uh, you know, so we, yeah, we, you know, we want to, we want to get involved. So if you'd that. be willing to approve a resolution and now that I have a, an answer from somebody who can make me help, maybe help me find the language, That'd you would be willing to approve signature of a resolution at your convenience. That would be great because then we could get it out to them. So I'll second yeah. Carolyn's motion. Okay. Okay. Is there any further discussion other than the same? We're all really sorry and we yeah. absolutely are going to do this. Yes. Um, all right. All those in favor? I, Trevor McDaniel. I, Dave Wolfram. I, Carolyn Ness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hatfield. I'm, I'm so sorry. That's how embarrassing. Well, um, they have a lot of stuff that they did online and they sent me, uh, Char sent me a bunch of information with the events um, events links. So if you want them, I'm happy to send them out. It's really yeah. neat to watch. I'd love to watch them. Absolutely. Okay. Oh yeah, that's good. I'll send them out. Um, okay, next item on the agenda is our appointments. We have two police appointments, um, Andrew Habel and uh, Dylan Husted. Um, part-time um 
I will take a motion to appoint them. I'll make that motion. Thank you, David. I'll second Trevor. That. Thank you, okay. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye, Trevor McDaniel. Aye, Dave Wolfram. Aye, Carolyn Ness. Thank you. Next yeah. item on yeah. the. What? Yeah. We're going to have to sit down and start thinking about our police departments here shortly. Yeah. Because yes. Of the new unfunded mandates that the state's passing. Yep. Yeah. I know. It's going to cost some problems for us. It's going to cost a lot of money. You yeah. know. Well, we need we problems need to have John. Uh, John has to come and talk to us because we're going to have to figure out some other strategy than we have been using. So. Um, yep. Yeah. To, you know, for our 24, because we have two police officers on 24 seven. So uh, I don't know what we're going to do on that. Um, okay. Line. Casey, maybe you can have John um, in a future meeting come. Yeah, I know um, he was still digging through that law that had been signed by the governor. And uh, yeah, we, we need to yeah. Doesn't it really doesn't give us a lot of directions, but it does cost us an awful lot of money, and we have yeah. to figure out how we can still maintain um, what we want to do and what we do do for community policing, um, and still be able to have an affordable budget. So uh, yeah, because you know, like I spent 14 years as a part-time officer in Deerfield under yeah. these new regulations, so I couldn't have done it. Nope. No, then there's not going to be any part time. No. Your, the ability to have part time officers is just not going to happen yeah. anymore. And I was doing yeah. it as a community service. I wasn't, you know. No, we, the problem is we'll we'll be training people and they'll be leaving. And and yeah. and oh, if yeah. we then keep them, we're going to be spending through the nose to keep them. It's it's just a horrendous bill, and uh, with no forethought in, in, into budgeting for the towns. Um, brutal. I mean, I'm all about police accountability and that that's not the question here. The question is how do you do it affordably in a small town and, and have a safe community and have, you know, community policing if you don't have people in the community. I know. I, I whatever. We'll have to work on that. Um so maybe we can set that up Casey with John yep. at some point. All right. Um Next item on the agenda is the appointment of ZBA um, full-time person. And then um, we, we do have four persons for the alternate position. Um, I, know, I know there was some discussion since to keep that open for a little bit longer for the alternate. Yeah. Um, is yeah. that what you wanted to do, Trevor and Dave, on that? I wouldn't mind. I mean, I, I think we should move up. Um... Uh, one member to the permanent um, and then see, you know, make, make one last request for people to apply for the, um, uh, the alternate position. And then uh, we also have the planning board, that position that we're going to. Correct. So yeah. uh, we should probably, um, cause people will probably be interested in the same type. So yeah. Uh, maybe we could post that somewhere on our website, Casey. I've just, I was just talking about that with Jennifer um, earlier. Okay. So we're going to, we don't have a vacancy tag right. or tab. Um, and I forget who brought it to my attention. Somebody, I think it was Annalee. Annalee brought it to my attention. We need a vacancy tab or something. So I was going to talk to Jennifer tomorrow and work, at, work that out with Pat because it, I might be missing where it is. And if I have, Pat can correct me, but yeah. um, we need to set up some way to push that information out. What we've started to do is try to notify people. And so you bringing it up is really useful. Hey, Jen. Hi, I think what it's, it's where we're, would say a vacancy is on each page, but it makes a lot more sense to have it in one location that says what right. word and how many vacancies and- Yeah. Know, right. yeah. <laughs> Guys, guys, we got to make our webpage user friendly. Lily and I talked about it, but we have, honest to God, Carolyn, we haven't forgotten. It's I know, just, I know. It's a, it's a longer process okay. than you think because we need information from the company and then we need to coordinate the information itself when it's there. I see the Lily. I see Lily. And, and, and I actually want to jump on this bandwagon because I wanted to bring this up a little later. 
I really need some help getting folks on the senior housing committee. So if you're putting up a help yeah. on a tab. Oh, thanks. And, Great. Okay, we can do that. <laughs> okay. But I also wanted to ask if the select board had specific, um, say, representatives from other committees that they wanted to see on there. But definitely, I. <laughs> Please, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Trevor, do you have a motion to make? Um, well, I would make a motion to appoint David Potter to the um, to the permanent position on the CBA. Okay, I'll second that. Any other discussion? Does anybody, Dave? What is your thoughts? I'm just making. I a thought Alex was the senior alternate. Um, I don't feel comfortable with Alex. Um, he's a grad student and he's living at home and he's probably gonna move on. Whereas Dave Potter lives in town. He's owns, is a homeowner, sends his kids to school. He's, you know, he's committed. Okay. <clears throat> so um, is there any further discussion, Dave? Who seconded? Trevor. Oh, no, I did. Oh, you... Trevor made the motion. Okay, all those in favor? Aye, Trevor McDaniel. How do you want to vote, Dave? I'm voting no. Okay, and I, I Carolyn Ness. Okay. Do you want to keep those, we, we do have four applicants for the zoning board alternate position. Do you want to keep that open for sure then and add the planning board into that for another two weeks? Okay, we'll put that off until our um, meeting on the 27th, Casey. And so it's really important that we put up for the planning board too. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. And we have a, uh, were we going to, meet with the planning board before i was gonna get there yeah so the planning board i john Waite reached out to me and asked when we could have a discussion with them because the planning board generally makes a recommendation about this yeah. so i just got an email back from rachel earlier in the meeting and confirmed i had suggested that we do it on the 27th and oh. she just confirmed that she would like to see that discussion scheduled with you all and so i'm just trying to work a timeout with her that way, by February 1st, you'll have had a discussion with them, at least preliminarily, and then can meet with them on the 1st and confirm an appointment. Okay. Dave, you can make, you can make the meeting on the 1st? Um, hold on. That's the 1st of, uh, of February, you said? Yeah. That's their first meeting, and they wanted to address it. Yeah, on the 1st, I can. Yeah. Okay. What time do they um, meet? At seven, right? They, they can... usually meet at seven. Okay. So, so what? So, what are we doing on the twenty seventh? We're basically they or... want to talk. They just want to have a conversation about what they might think needs to be addressed in terms of appointing, and maybe notify, um, make sure that we notify everybody prior to John Waits. Now you have John Waits' resignation in that. your mail, <clears throat> but make sure we remind people that the so appointment we, would be to, to the election and then we yeah. need to add that seat on the ballot to fulfill the rest of John Waite's term. Right, right. It wouldn't be to fill out his term forever. It would be just to- Right, it's just until the election is handled and then okay. you know the town elects somebody to fill the rest of his term. So yes. are, are we, are our elections gonna run the same time I mean, are they, we're not moving the elections, we're just moving. Well, we have to figure that out because we have to coordinate it with um, town meeting. Yeah, well, does it have to be the same time as town meeting? They, the way that our election runs, I was talking to Barbara about that. The way that our election runs, we need to have a conversation about it. And remember, we all decided that we would have this conversation and give people plenty of time, but how we, handle setting up the election as a separate ballot because they were always tied together. So we're waiting for a little more information. 
But last year we did we separated them, correct? Last year we were able to because of special legislation from the governor oh, that expires you. in March. Ah, so see. we and the you should know that Barbara's been paying you know real close attention to this because the the town clerks association is trying to get the legislature to realize that not every town in Massachusetts has an election in March. Right. Most right. of them have elections after March right. and they just didn't take that into account when they extended it. And so they've only extended it to March, but they haven't and nothing further. You figure they'd go right. to July. I something. would have thought they would have, but I guess that's been a frustration on the clerk's part because they all realized very early on that yeah. most towns don't, there's probably a handful of towns that have their annual election in March. They must be in so, the I'm sorry to be dense, but can we just go back just a bit? So what are we doing on the 27th? We You're talking we doing... to the planning board about their possible recommendations for an appointment. And okay. So they wanted not... it to be a conversation before they, before you suddenly get having a decision to make yeah. on so the first. Hold off on the decision a little bit. So now? they're not, do they want to do interviews or? Just... I don't know. I think that's what they want to have a conversation about. Okay. So we are just having a conversation on the 27th yep. on how we want to proceed on the 1st. That's what I think, but all I've got in there is a conversation with the planning board about the appointment because that's you guys really need to talk that through both boards. Okay. All right. I, in I the just, meeting. It's not clear in my mind what we were going to do. So John had asked for for a discussion to happen before February 1st was really where it started. And so I offered to save an appearance spot on the 27th agenda so that you could have a preliminary conversation with the anticipation of perhaps making an appointment February 1st. Is that our okay. next meeting is the 27th? Is that the right? Idea? Yes. Yeah. It's our your next, next meeting is the 27th and we were setting up a meeting with the joint meeting with the planning board on the 1st to make a decision. But, um, okay. okay. So as that was his request. So I'm conveying his request. Yeah. I've already coordinated the fact that Rachel thinks we need to do that. Um, so I put it on as an appearance. I'm just trying to figure out a time with her. Okay, as long as the planning board feels that we are working with them collaboratively yes. and we're trying to set up something that will be a collective decision I'm, I'm fine with it. Okay. I just don't want, I mean, we don't meet until for two weeks and then, you know, I don't want people upset. Like Anna Lee is sitting here, you know, Anna Lee might have some, you know, or Denise Mason, they might have input into this. And so that's pretty important. Well, that's why you would have a joint meeting to sort of create those parameters and then you have two weeks to think about it, both committees. You have two weeks to think about it, and then February 1st, you reconvene and discuss it again. Yeah. Okay. All right. That was kind of what I think John was doing, but John isn't here, so I don't want to put words in his mouth. Okay. okay. All right. Next item on the agenda is the um, business meeting. I, I yes. hope you signed. Did you sign us all up, Casey? Yeah. Yes, we're all registered. We're good. Uh, okay. We should be getting an email about this tomorrow i think is when they said we would get it okay. um and but we need to delegate a meeting a person to vote at the annual business the mma annual business meeting i think generally you do it carolyn but because everything's remote they wanted us to send them confirmation do you know exactly when the business meeting is it is i do actually the time the actual time oh. slot because yeah. whoever it is whoever Friday the 22nd it. at hold on oh I just had it too <laughs> I think it's the morning meeting it's the morning meeting and DP I have a DPH meeting at nine o'clock nine to ten I took the day off to be at those so um as I do every year uh so if you need me to fill in I can so do. the annual business meeting is one to two p.m on Friday the 22nd Oh, okay. One to two, I can do. I just was, I didn't want to miss my DPH um, webinar. You know, I mean, that's twice weekly, but it usually has very good information. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't mind doing it if you want me to do it. It's remote. <laughs> it's, like everything. 
it's just as boring as it usually is every year. So I would rather have Dave and Trevor make sure that we go to more workshops. Do we, can we just coordinate what workshops were, can you, Dave and Trevor, both look at what workshops are you're interested in so that we hit as many as possible? Yeah, well, um, usually, yeah, here's the MMA. Uh, the MMA. So if you look for the MMA annual conference, Trevor, yeah. you'll see the schedule. I haven't well, figured out how to print it and send it to you, though. <laughs> That's what I was trying remotely. to do before the meeting. The first one that we get rewards for is governing remotely. <laughs> oh, yes. We're good at that. Ready, ready, set, leave. Thriving in virtual reality is the next one. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I don't know if we'd call it thriving. Yeah, right. Getting public health right. Yep. I think we can we can get that one too. So if you look, what you can do is if you look yeah. online and I do a Google all, yeah. search of the MMA annual yep. conference, oh, it, it'll we, pop up. Usually, You'll be able to get to the schedule. Yeah, we usually um, have the printout of of the ones, and we exactly and they haven't out. sent it. <laughs> That's yeah. what I was trying well, to find it. Yeah, they're all right here under workshops, so you can just see all of them uh, listed online. It, and it's it pretty easy. Yep. The panelists, the moderators. So you know what you could do? You could let me know the things that you're interested in. And then yeah. um, okay. that way, just, if there's a problem. How about pandemic permitting? <laughs> Is that about, really one of them? Yes. How about we all like sit in, the, sit on the dais figuratively and tell people how we've experienced this. <laughs> okay, I'll stop laughing. I'll print it obviously, out. we're going to have you. to look. If you can get a printout of the workshop, can I just go to the web page and is it, yes. is it there on the I'm web? I'm send you a link, Carolyn. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, Dave, if you could look at them and Trevor look at them and give it to Casey. Now, we got to make sure because we what happens is we always budget every year. We get credit for our, yes. our insurance. Right. Is there My any MR. of them? Is there any of them that give credit for oh, yeah, insurance? I'm just reading them all. There's they're, several. They're all the rewards. Okay. So we can need to hit at least, we got to max out our insurance credits. Yeah. So, um, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and there's 10 of them, 11 of them. Okay. So I think we only get credit. We, we have to go to at least three of them. Yeah. Um, Because you only get, you're only allowed 15% or, you know, you only get three credits. Yeah. We'll hit all of those. Um, yeah. uh, total. So what so, we could do is figure out the most, send me an email and let me know after we look at okay. it. Jennifer will so everyone look at it. We, we, we got to make sure that we get credit for at least three of the ones that on our insurance. And um, also any, any of them that save money. Now, what, one of the things that we always do to try to save money is we try to connect with the state people. How are they, are, are they, still available to us can we i mean that's how we met lisa and figured out how we're going to hopefully save three hundred thousand dollars a year um in our school funding so is how are the how is the state so they, they're creating networking rooms and the oh. networking is i have to say is a little bit more difficult but they have these networking breakout rooms really um yeah That'll be fine. All right, Trevor, you yep. need to track down how you can get into the networking room with the with that group that that woman that just disappeared that gave us the you know was going to help. Oh, she's us gone. In her housing. She's gone, know, and I've reached out three times, and they have not given me a name that replaces her. All right, I know, oh. but we need to go to that that community development per place networking thing. That's I'm going to make charge you with that because I'm never going to be able to do those chat box things. Yeah, I can do all that. But, but you need to figure out who it is we're going to connect with, because, and then we're going to connect Lily and the senior housing with whoever you can We can find. With, okay? Yeah. Yes. Poor Lily. Okay. Thank you. No, Lily, we're not giving up. Even if it's <laughs> virtual, I'm, we're making sure we're going to connect with somebody again. Yes. Um, we do this every year. And we just get to the point and then God, it's, you know, it's just so awful. All right. So that's the one thing that I can think of off the top of my head that we've got to chase down. Dave, yeah. is there anything that you can think of that we're over the year? Okay. Also, we got to complain about this police thing because we're going to go broke 
doing yeah. the kind of policing that we want to do. And I, I, I'm, I'm just refused to think that we have to back down on our standards just to cope. So um, we, need to, we need to figure out some kind of networking on the police. And then Dave, is there anything else that you can think of? Um, Maybe uh, Dave uh, should, do, should take that one on. Yeah. I'll swing by the town office tomorrow, look at the uh, agenda for the MMA. Yep, I okay. said to all the workshops too. Yeah, because I'm off tomorrow, so. Great. You know, okay. it's Friday. It's Friday, and my kid, my grandkids are remote, so maybe they can help me get into one of those chat rooms. <laughs> Put them to work. I know. Yeah, uh -huh. Anna Lee. Yes, I have a question. Um, in relation to the police reform, I'm wondering if this would be a, a time, an opportunity to get some community input, also. Just community on. input into. In into which? Oh, uh, the. Just uh, what some of the. Potential Changes we're going to have we're going to have John come to one of our meetings and um, talk about what the bill means from 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 how we operate now and the, and yes we're going to set up some kind of discussion on um, you know the just community policing in general and that, what we want to do because um, unfortunately um, the bill bill was not as good I mean I was hopeful I mean there's good things about it certainly accountability i don't think any yeah. of us have any issues with accountability and we don't worry about our officers being one of the you know issues but the way they're structuring how they're going about it is going to cost us an arm and a leg and that means we've got to sacrifice some training and i don't want to do train you know i i, 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 I think training for us is huge and and we really push that and, and also community policing and, and a lot of interfacing with the community. And I, uh, it's very discouraging. So yes, we're gonna have, we'll have, we'll set something up. Casey is gonna set up something with John right I now. I sent him a request. Okay. So I'll chat we'll, with him we'll work, on, we'll work on this, Anna Lee, because it's very important now that we have, know what's happening. But I also think there's gonna be a huge amount of pushback and the, how they roll this out is going to be changed a little bit because if we're complaining about the cost, it's it's going to be every other town in the play, in the state. Oh, all 351 communities will be complaining about the cost and how are they? How do you fund this? And so the whole implementation is going to be changed a little bit, just because it's not affordable the way it's structured right now. So, um, anyway. Um, that's oh. one of the things we're going to be talking about, I'm sure, for the MMA. It's got I'm to sure. be. So right. did somebody want to make a motion to delegate Carolyn to go to the MMA annual business meeting? I'll make that motion. I'll second it. All right. Thank you. I'm sorry it's been so fuss budgety. Um, all those in favor? Aye, Trevor McDaniel. Aye, Dave Wolfram. Aye, Carolyn Ness. So Casey, you're gonna organize us on um, and make sure there's good communication between now and next week on the, um, is it next, yeah, it's next week. Yes, it's okay. next week. It's next okay. Thursday and Friday, not Friday oh. and Sunday. Well, the, or right. Saturday. Carolyn, if so, you go on the webpage, Carolyn, the first thing is how to navigate MMA annual meeting video. So yes, know, they have videos. I know, but I got to call them because my password doesn't work anymore. I don't know what Mine happened. doesn't either. And I've had trouble getting them to respond to me. So I'll see if I, I can know, remember. I know, they're working for remote. I, I couldn't even get, when I was on the nominating committee, I couldn't even, some, I had to call in so that I could get on. I mean, it was ridiculous. So yeah, I, and that never got fixed. So I, thought, I just want to make sure we don't miss out. It's number one critical. We don't miss out on our credits for insurance because we actually budget those savings. So, um, did, so they're going to send Carolyn. I mean, uh, Casey. They're going to send us an email with our registration. They're supposed to send us an update. I'll yeah. let Jennifer. Jennifer did the registration, so I'm just okay, going to yeah. throw her under the bus on this one. Put it on so we have. Our I, I sent you all the blurb that came when it added into my Outlook calendar. So oh. I sent that in an email to you all. So it said that they'll be sending it out. So I'm assuming that you'll get it tomorrow because that will be a, a week. A week is what they had said. Okay. So, and then if I get anything, I will let you know. I also was in contact with somebody when I reset my password. Or actually, because I have ATA, it was 
somebody else's, it would be the former ATA. So they had to reset mine and it was done pretty quickly. So I'll look back in my email and see who I contacted and it, should, it shouldn't be that difficult to get yours fixed, Carolyn. Okay, I don't know what happened. I, I think I got, remember uh, we went to the select board two thing and when yeah. I switched to that select board two, it, it, it wouldn't work after that. So okay. I, I don't know, I don't I know what happened. Contact person, I could fix that. I'll look into that tomorrow. Thank wow. You. Anyway, okay. So next item on the agenda is mail um, and, and your reports, Tracy. Okay, so we had a couple of things on the mail I wanted to draw your attention to. Um, we have a request to transfer a liquor license for the Deerfield Convenience Store. And we've scheduled the hearing for 6.30 p.m. on the 27th. Um, John Waite's resignation is on, is in the mail. And so my question to you is, do you want to formally acknowledge the resignation and note to the public, and so accept it, and note to the public that the position will be on the next election ballot to fill the term. We talked about it a few minutes ago. Okay. Yes. Um, we want to thank John for all his years of amazing uh, <laughs> doing the planning board. It was many, many years, many meetings um, and thank him and good luck in his new home. And we're sorry he's moving out of Deerfield. We are. Um, so, and it, so the position will be opened. Um, we do like I said, I do want to acknowledge that we have four um, really um, interested people in the ZBA alternate position. Um, alternate is usually scooted up to full time when there's a full time opening. So it's a, even though it's an alternate, it's a very serious um, commitment. And, um, and when people aren't there for whatever reason, the alternate does have the opportunity to vote. So it is very serious. Um, so that's wonderful that we have at least four people interested. And, um, but we would love to see some interest in the planning board as well. Um, okay. Do we, we don't, we, the, John um, really resigns for, to the town clerk. So we don't- He does, but vote. actually Barbara asked me to um, have you acknowledge that because, you know, it, it is such, he's fulfilled this position for so long and been so instrumental in so many actions that the town has taken. But she also wanted to make it clear to people by having you acknowledge the fact that the term, the appointment is for now to the election, but the election ballot term is for the rest of his, the rest of what John, John would have served. And how many, he's got one more year or two more years? I don't know. I okay. don't know. Um, well, it's, it's, it's not this election, it's at least another year. So we'll, we'll sort that out. Yep. Um, on the convenience store liquor license transfer, um, mm -hmm. do you wanna set the hearing? You have set a hearing we for set, the Yeah, the hearing date set for the 27th at 6.30 PM because we had to get the notifications out. We have, if you recall, ABCC has very strict timelines. Yes. Um, so that's all scheduled. We'll have the um, information in the packet for you. It's, it's, I think it's fairly routine. Um, it's a transfer of the liquor license, change of the manager, a regular, the changes you would see when a, when a property turns over. Um, and I did include the notice of the FY 2022 sludge costs that Trevor mentioned earlier in the meeting. Okay. And that was an email from Janamine that was forwarded from Kevin, as well as the, the schedule of increases for the different towns. Um, you mentioned earlier in the meeting that we have the North Main Street property info session on Tuesday. So that's in there. And then for my updates, I've been, I asked Trevor for some help with this, that um, Hatfield Van I need to have somebody take a look at it. So I asked Trevor to help me out with that. Yes. And once we get an evaluation on, you know, whether there's major issues with it, um, following the board's 
accept it, it following that information um we could probably take possession of that van assuming we don't have any large issues so that's on my radar screen i asked trevor for some help yep. and then one thing that i it came up in an email conversation amongst a couple of employees is asking the board to consider implementing a mileage policy using the irs and dls guidelines and the irs mileage rate we've never done one um but is this can i just interrupt you for two seconds is this because um of covid where uh people are using their own vehicles to go everywhere and nobody not necessarily car, because of COVID, pulling. it's just to solve a policy problem that we've had. COVID just happens to reconnect it all. Okay. Um, no, it's we've never had a mileage policy and the mileage rate that's been approved for a long time is way below what even the IRS rate's been for the last 10 years. Um, but the more important piece of it is a policy that encompasses how those things are calculated and stuff. We have guidance from DLS um, that town accountants are given. And that could be incorporated into a policy, but it also reflects the fact that the IRS mileage changes every year and we would incorporate a statement that says this will be reviewed on an annual basis, very similar to the OPEB policy that you folks have. And so I would develop that and bring it to your attention. Um, do you have any idea what the cost impact would be? Well, that's part of what we need to find out, but there isn't a lot of mileage reimbursement that happens. I know, I don't, I don't think it really is impactful, but I wanna make sure that, um, well, COVID, because people aren't allowed to carpool anymore, or shouldn't be carpooling, they have to say, use their individual cars for stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I understand this year would be a little bit more expensive and we probably could get away with, you know, submitting that under the COVID expenses. But um, I do wanna say long-term, one of the reasons we're, we always have such a low reimbursement is to discourage um, personal use. So, if right, but there are times that we've had to do this. I know um, when we go for trainings and conferences. I a lot know. of the training actually has been remote, so it's this year it's going to save us money. But I do think that this operational model is going to continue because functionally it's a little bit easier for people to train now that we've had to figure out how to do it. Right. I, well, and everybody's used to it now, so yeah okay um okay all right so i can i can come up with something so that you have something to look at i do know the finance committee will probably not be in favor of it but i also know that most of the towns around us have some sort of a mileage policy in place that recognizes the cost for maintaining a vehicle when you're performing your work you know and paying for the gas and that sort of thing so that's the reason those things get put into place all right and that's really what I had. Okay. All right. Um, public comment. Do we have any public comment? I think. Uh, yeah. none, this, uh, thank you. Very, very excellent meeting. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Chris. That's lovely input. <laughs> I see Lily's hand up. Oh, it's me again. Um, I just thought I would take a moment to ask um, more sort of officially um, that uh, seek your guidance on. I, one of the things I was thinking is if you guys are cool with it, I might post on Deerfield now saying that the senior housing committee is coming together or would you rather do it more um, guided by you all? I, How about on our Facebook page? You can send yeah. it to me and I can put it up on our Facebook page. And then we can always share that through other avenues. But yeah, if it's posted there first, that'd be great. And then we figure out, you know, this whole vacancy area on the website, Lily. Yeah. Wait, what Facebook page is this? The town town Facebook. Facebook. Right. Yeah, we have a town Facebook. We had to recreate it, but it's there. I had no idea. Yes. Yeah, well, we, we had problems transitioning problems. it. Well, so Poor Jennifer had to figure that out too. So why don't I do this? I'll write something up and give it to Jennifer. Perfect. That'd that be great. Then, and it's really just a call for all interested parties to indicate their interest. And, um, and but I, it would be good. I mean, 
I think Carolyn Lily, what you know, you don't know. I mean, obviously we were thrilled with anybody volunteering, but the whole point is to get some cross section yeah. on on the boards and 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 have a wide range of skills come to the board. So by advertising that anyone that's interesting, hope hopefully people will apply. And, the, and then we could try to figure out um, and make sure that we have a balanced or as much I was thinking. You know, work together and, and also keep people up for subcommittees because I feel like this is not gonna be just one committee and this is gonna go forward. Yeah. You're gonna have all kinds of subcommittees. And if we get people interested, hopefully there'll be enough people interested that we can have subcommittees that will be productive as well. And that's how you get all the work done. I think that what I was thinking about for the post was, you know, how in the mission it talks about the different things that have to get done. That actually in the post, I would say, please indicate where you can um, contribute so that we, then people know what they're in for. And right, what they're looking for. Right, right. And, and what we need to have done, at least to get started. Right, and really? I mean, you, potentially you have all kinds of, um, commitment time-wise to get get up and started and all that kind of stuff and and you know how many years we've been disappointed how many hours have we invested in this and we've been disappointed and even now Trevor is a perfect example we got so excited Casey's first day practically was you know the person coming out in Boston yes we're going ahead and I, I mean, honestly, and then, I, was seeing, I was seeing dollar signs. I was so excited. I could hardly contain myself. And then what happened? Person quit or left or whatever. I don't know what happened. Maybe I don't know either. Them. They would never tell me. I know. It was weird. Okay. So then, all right, that sounds like a way forward. I will send something to Jennifer. She can wordsmith it to be official. And um, we can at least get the ball rolling and then you guys are going to create a help. Well, Trevor's committed to going to that, chasing that down. Thank you. And we got Dave committed for, you know, policing stuff. And so at least, and we're going to go to the insurance thing. So at least we're covered on some of these bases. And if you can think of anything or we can think of anything, reach out to Trevor and make sure he gets some notes and stuff to, you know, so he can be able to be productive. I have no doubt he will be. <laughs> well, I mean, we're trying to, you, you, that basically you go to hustle money. There's no question about it, but you know, whatever. Anyway, Jennifer. Ones, right? I just wanted to have um, just, where would you like any of the contacts, you know, from, exactly. from Facebook, just to direct to your email that you had or? I'm going to be using my, ldwhite.seniorhousing at deerfield.life. Yeah, so you'll just put that in your make, app. Yeah, make sure that's in there. Okay, thanks. <laughs> I have six emails. I can hardly handle it. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> Thank you all. And I just have one more thing to say. I cannot believe the amount of work that you guys do. Thank you so no. much. I, it's... Thank you, Casey and Jen. <laughs> well, it's, it's, you know, we're all in this together and we all work together because we love our community and we are going to go forward and we'll, we will make, make it through and there is light at the end of the tunnel and we just got to hang in there. It just, some weeks are tougher than other weeks. <laughs> That's the truth. So, yeah. Anyway, um, if that's it. Uh, then the upcoming meeting next Tuesday, I haven't even focused on it, but we're going to do it, um, is the park discussion at uh, six o'clock on the 19th. So that's the 19th of January, next Tuesday. Our next select board meeting is January 27th. Um, the next after that, we have the February 10th and 24th. Oh my God. And we also have February 1st, don't forget. Oh yes, February 1st. Oh, I forgot to write that down. It's a good thing, Daisy. Um, gosh, you have it written out it till agenda. August. You have it out till August. I as do because I had to stop because my brain was filling up. 
Well, remember, if you're if you are projecting it out, no meetings before Thanksgiving or Christmas. <laughs> oh, I know. I remember that. I learned my lesson the first year. <laughs> That's my only request. <laughs> I know. <laughs> None of us get sticky buns if that happens. So yeah. <laughs> I know. Shut up. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to I wanted to let you guys know too that David's camera is actually frozen. Okay. Oh, he's so, not asleep. He's David, not. I oh, thought not you were asleep. asleep. <laughs> His camera's frozen. All right. All yeah. right. Well, we yeah, won't give know. David a hard time. No. I, I thought he was getting upset because I was putting too many of telling him to go to those chat things or whatever. <laughs> you know, I just texted him and I said, David, and he said right. yes. <laughs> so. Okay. Casey's camera is frozen too in front of me. Says, so. yeah. yeah. Oh, I can oh, hear his frozen. voice. <laughs> okay, technical issues. Really, I know simple. it's technical yeah. issues, and I and I have my the dog is sitting here looking me, so I <laughs> it's time to go. Dog yeah. saying, "Let's go now." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank well, you, everybody. Yes. Um, I'll take a motion to adjourn. I'll second I'll that. Second that. Yeah. Oh, I heard Dave. Dave, your camera's frozen, Doubles. but we hear you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All those in favor? Aye, Trevor McDaniel. Aye, Dave Wolfram. Aye, Carolyn Ness. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for a lovely meeting. Um, take care. <laughs>